I'm Eric Bramer, joined by Jake Garcia. The Wareham Gatemen look to continue their winning ways. They've won three straight, and they're looking to do something that they haven't done since their four-game winning streak in their championship season of 2012. Right, a lot of parallels between this season and their last championship, which occurred in 2012. We talked about it a lot on the broadcast last night. Their start, 3-1 and one on the season, is their best since 2012. And now, like you said, a four-game winning streak, something they haven't done since then as well. Again, it's early, and these stats really don't mean much, but when looking at the run differential as well, it's better than it was in 2012. So just some fun tidbits to talk about before the game. They'll look for win number four against the Harwood. Mariners, a team with a lot of talent, but they've had some trouble scoring runs. Exactly, and so far this season in all four games, more strikeouts than hits for the offense, and 17 on opening day, not a good sight to look at. This team has a lot of firepower in terms of names, but in terms of actual offensive production, not a lot of power in this lineup. It's built primarily on small ball and on speed, and if the Gateman can play fundamentally sound defense, that neutralizes that. So a matchup advantage for the Gateman. The Gateman pitching has been excellent so far this year. Tonight they'll turn to a guy that's kind of an unknown quantity in Ryan Williamson. He was with the Gateman last year, didn't pitch all that well, didn't pitch very well during his college season, but he's here because he has stuff. He has the potential to be a really good pitcher. Exactly, and talking with Cooper Ferris before the game, they said that his transformed body is going to make a huge difference, and that's essentially why they brought him back. Like you said, though, really unknown, so it'll be interesting to see what he showcases here tonight. We're now joined by the third member of our broadcast team, Megan O'Brien. Megan has more on Ryan Williamson. Thanks, guys. Earlier today, I, I, I talked to Coach Jim Lawler about Ryan Williamson. As you mentioned, he was here with the Gateman last year, did not perform tremendously for the Gateman, went back to NC State, and Jim Lawler described him as coming here last year as a chubby freshman. Now says his body has entirely changed and has the potential to throw numerous pitches. Uh, Lawler said he's not so worried about the velocity, but worried more about the control. He says Williamson has improved on that so much since last year, so it will be interesting to see how he handles that tonight on the mound. And we'll send it over to break. Stay with us for Gateway to the Game. Wareham Gateman Baseball is on the air from the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and WCTV. We have a full video stream planned for you this evening. It's an absolutely beautiful evening for baseball here in Wareham. The sun shining, probably no fog rolling in, at least not for a while. We dealt with that last night. But it looks to be another excellent night at the ballpark. Gateman will try and make it more excellent by winning their fourth straight game. They're three and one on the year, tied for first in their division after their best start in quite a long while. And if the success continues, they will inevitably draw comparisons to their championship season of 2012. And that's exactly the case here tonight. We saw three guys go on and get activated here today for the Gaten, and that was in the form of Ryan Williamson, Charlie Warren, and Mark Caribiotis, all three of them slotting into the starting lineup for the Gaten. And it's funny because we talk about how great this team's been, or maybe great's the wrong word, but above average, maybe better than anticipated, and then they're getting replacements in. these. These guys who come in from the College World Series from really talented teams, so it's a scary thought, but this team can be even better than can be even better than it has been. Yeah, I wouldn't describe their play so far as excellent. I would say sufficient. You look at them, and the pitching's been good, the hitting's been good, aren't really excelling in any facet of the game, but they've won a couple of close ball games last night. Probably the closest call they've had, tying run at second with two down in the ninth, with Chase Pittsbarth. Retiring the last battery faced. The Harwich Mariners, on the other hand, are not really doing anything well right now, to be honest with you. You see their starting pitcher right there. That's Evan Anderson. More on him later. Right now we are going to be broadcasting the national anthem for you. So we will be back after that. At this time, we ask you to please rise and move your caps for the singing of the national anthem. Singing the national anthem tonight are six of the younger members of the Showstoppers Community Service Singing Troop based in Malapoise of Massachusetts. Please welcome Ayla Geoch, Abby Wixon, Will Wixon, Olive Wareham, Brianna Lynch, Jenna Lynch of Malapoise, and Nolan Gibbons of Marion.
They will face Ryan Williamson, who we mentioned in the open, was with the Gateman last year, only got a couple appearances and did not do very well. But in our, in our pregame chat with Cooper Ferris, he said that he did not see enough of him to really get a good glimpse of what he's capable of. And he'll toe the rubber tonight in a very good matchup for him. We talked about how Harwich has been struggling at the plate, and that's a confidence booster if he's able to go out throw five, six innings. Megan mentioned, or at least I think she did a little bit, on his former teammate in Carlos Rodon. First round draft pick who ultimately went to the White Sox, but he's his mentor, and with that mentorship comes the slider. So be on the lookout for that pitch tonight. It could be a good one. Gateman have gotten really, really good pitching performances all year. In fact, only two different pitchers have given up more than one earned run so far this year. Connor Jones, we saw last night, gave up two. He has yet to record an out, so his ERA is technically infinite. But then Anthony Kay, who was the opening day starter and was expected to be one of the best pitchers on the staff, had some struggles in his game against the Brewster Whitecaps. Other than that, though, the team pitching to the tune of a 2.57 ERA, 24 strikeouts in 35 innings, and we'll see what the lefty Williamson can do tonight. Harwich was also a team that was exposed to the fog last night. They got it a little bit worse than the Gateman did. A 45-minute fog delay last night when they were at Hyannis. That did conclude. The game did conclude. Harwich ended up falling in that game, but here at Wareham last night, we saw the fog roll in, and it uh, kind of was an obstacle for the fielders on a few plays, but didn't affect. At least I don't think it affected the outcome of the game. Yeah, it's a miracle it did not impact it more. First pitch from Williamson is sent to center field. Routine for Warren. Charlie Warren, a fresh face on this Gateman staff on the roster. He puts it away for out number one. More on him when he comes to bat. The shortstop, number two, Connor Justice from Georgia Tech. Talking about the immense strikeout totals for Harwich so far, Nick Walker putting that ball in play, the only guy on this Harwich team who has yet to strike out this season. It's an incredible feat because this team has been piling up strikeouts in bunches and normally that's contagious. Connor Justice steps to the dish. He takes a strike on the outside corner. The 0-1, misses just high, ball one. Pretty good pitch, but a good take by Justice to even up the count. Justice is, has been slotting in the number six spot in all four games so far for Harwich, and here today moving up to number two in the batting order. He takes a strike on the inside corner, batting only 182 in the young season. He's played in three games, 11 at-bats, two for 11. One of those hits, though, went for extra bases. It was a triple. The one-two from Williamson to Justice. Check swing in the dirt. He did not go. That might have been that slider that you talked about. We'll see if he has faith in that as the game progresses. Williamson being caught by Ryan Flesh behind the plate. Back at the dish after a night off last night, or a start off. Ball misses wide, three and two. Ryan Flesh considered a superior defensive catcher over Max Siebert, so he came in the game late last night. Full count delivery is hit sharply to the left side. Nice diving stop by Caraviotis. He knocks it down, can't do anything more than that. Another fresh face on this roster, Mark Caraviotis, middle infielder from Oregon, playing third base last night, probably because Preston Grand Prix has had such a solid showing so far for Wareham. Yeah, and he may have not made that last play in which he ranged over to his left and laid out, hit off his glove, but when you, whenever you have two shortstops, two bona fide shortstops playing on the left side of this infield, it automatically gives you a more defensive-oriented lineup. Caraviotis received all the starts this season at Oregon at shortstop, and here today playing third base, so above average range, more than you'd expect from a third baseman. Ball one misses high. Oh. 
strike one, finds the plate. A righty heavy lineup for the Mariners. The runner goes, 1-1, one, one, low in the dirt, no throw down to second. And that's exactly what we talked about in the pregame. This team not afraid to take the extra base. Whenever they get they do get guys on base, they will get them in motion. And you saw it right there. Justice red ball in the dirt. Didn't hesitate and swipe second base. The count one and two to Noisy. Noisy spelled N-E-U-S-E. Checking the runner and delivering to the plate. Low in the dirt. Ball two. So now a runner in scoring position and one down for the heart of this Mariners lineup. Preston Palmero waiting on deck. The 2-2. Two -two. Slashed foul back to the screen. No, is he not your prototypical number three hitter? He was a former Big 12 freshman of the year a year ago. And then this past season, numbers really took a step back. Only modest power hit less than 10 home runs. And at a school like Oklahoma, that he can get away with that in the middle of that lineup. And I guess here for Harwich, he can as well. But not an immense amount of power from the three hitter. 2-2 two, two misses low. Noisy leading the team in both at bats and now tied for the lead in hits. You know it's not good when through four games... The team leader in hits has three hits. I beg your pardon, Nick Walker has four. My finger was covering up Walker's stat line. Still not that impressive as the runner checked back to second. Tanner Kirk had more than three hits in one game, though. A few of them were the lucky sort, but still, you'd expect more to fall in for this Harwich team, and they've been struggling at the plate. 2-2 two -two to Noisy. Hit in the air down the right field line, foul, and it'll land off the fence. Someone from the Gateman bullpen will run over, scoop that up. Another 2-2. Two -two. It'll have to wait as Williamson checks the runner back. Just as singled with one out here in the first. And advance a second on a stolen base. The 2-2. Two -two. Hit sharply left side. Grand Prix in the hole. Throws to first. And it goes back. Back to the fence. One run will score Noisy into second. He takes a wide turn. He'll stay there. It'll be interesting to see what the official score rules that last play, but the I'm kind of surprised Preston Grand, Grand Prix Preston didn't range over and toss on to third base. It looked like he had Justice dead in his tracks, and that ball taking him over to third base, all he had to do was flip on and instead opts for the much more difficult throw, and he is going to be punished for that, uh, officially ruled an error. So Noisy takes Justice's spot at second, Justice scoring the first run of the game. I'm going to call that an E6 for the time being. First pitch, a breaking ball misses high. Preston Palmero, son of Rafael Palmero, 500 home run club. Check swing. But he went. Preston Palmero, some good numbers this season at NC State. 316, seven home runs, but the Gatemen have a guy who probably overshadowed him for the most part this season. That came in the form of Andrew Kisner. Right up the middle. Grand Prix can't get it. It'll go into center field. Noisy had to hold up at second. He'll just advance to third, but a single, the second of the inning, third base runner of the inning. And the Mariners have runners at the corners with one out for Johnny Adams. The third baseman, this game so Johnny far Adams. really Star representing Austin. what we've seen in the numbers of Ryan Williamson, and that's that he's hittable. This season, opponents hit over 300 against him in 35 innings. Here today, already two singles and four balls in play. So the strikeout stuff... And the stuff that Coach Cooper Ferris alluded to, at least we haven't seen any of it through four batters. Johnny Adams, the third baseman, steps to the plate. He takes inside ball one. 
The runner at third, Noisy. Runner at first, Palmero. Williamson steps off the rubber, composes himself, and steps back on. Checking the runner at first. He goes. The ball is bunted foul towards the Gateman dugout. Both runners going. Looked like a bit of a safety squeeze there. And that's exactly what you'd expect from a team that's struggling at the dish. And talking about how Harwich has relied on speed this season, they haven't really even done that with much success. Four for ten in stolen bases so far, so getting runners in motion hasn't proven to have much dividends and have much of a positive effect on the team. The 1-1 one, one sent foul down the right field line, 1-2. and two. But the fact that they continue to try and do that, and we've seen it in this game early on so far, should signal that maybe not a whole lot of confidence in the batters at the dish. We'll see if Williamson goes to that slider ahead in the count one and two. First he throws over. Palmero back without a slide. I'm sure this has been the case throughout these first few games, but the sun directly in the eyes of David McKinnon over at first base. 1-2, hit weakly, right side back and out of play. And thinking about the pickoff moves that we've seen so far here on this season, I feel like they've progressively gotten quicker and harder as the games went along. Maybe that's to be expected. You don't want to show the team your A move in only the first inning, but I'm sure the sun that's just really glaring in the eyes of McKinnon isn't doing him any favors. The sun in foul territory down the left field line, and yes, pretty much if you're extrapolating the line between the pitcher's mound and first base. As Adams takes strike three looking. Second out of the inning, and it's a godsend for Williamson who's really struggling. He's not out of the woods yet as Kevin Biggio steps up. Again, a note on lineage, Kevin Biggio, son of Hall of Famer Craig Biggio. Williamson ahead in the count, 0-1. The pitch hit well to right center field. Jabs back, Warren back, Jabs can't get it. One run will score. Palmero rounding third, he'll head home. It's a two RBI double for Kevin Biggio. And after struggling so mightily these first four games, the Harwich Mariners jump out in the first, three nothing. And man, that pitch from Williamson caught way too much of the plate. Biggio, an incredibly dangerous hitter. He's one of the most highly touted second base prospects in the entire country. And to leave a fastball over the plate like that with runners on base, man, Biggio just absolutely punished that one. No chance for either Jabs or Warren to track that one down. Now Matt Gonzalez, the left fielder. First pitch taken, high ball one. Those runs will be unearned because of the error by the shortstop Grand Prix. Fisted foul, one and one. The first run, I believe, will still be earned. Justice reached on a single, stole second. Would have come in probably on the single by Palmero. Biggio at second, the one, one. Off speed pitch gets a swing and a miss. Matt Gonzalez, the left fielder today for Harwich in this lineup because he just got here and Cole Fabio has been occupying his posi position over in left field, but he's been playing out of position. Fabio, a second baseman by trade, getting tonight off, and Gonzalez will slot into his prototypical left field spot. 1-2, a breaking pitch that just misses inside and maybe a little bit high. It's 2-2 two and two now. The pitch to Gonzalez, high fastball, got him. 
So Williamson strikes out two in the first. Unfortunately for him, he surrenders three runs. At the end of a half inning, it's Harwich three. The Gatemen are coming to bat. Everyone knows about the Cranberry Harvest Celebration, sponsored by AD Makepeace Company in October. But did you know that the company also offers custom cranberry tours throughout the year? Makepeace can host your company picnic or family event in the historic box mill on Tyhanet Pond. Visit admakepeace.com to learn more. The Gateman coming to bat, they're in an early 3-0 hole, it's a position they're not very familiar with. If anything, it's been the Gateman getting out to early leads during this early run of success. We'll try and make up for lost time with this lineup. Tanner Kirk leading off playing second base, batting second in right field, Jay Jabs. Batting third, the designated hitter, Darren Shepard. Batting clean up the left fielder, Logan Sowers. Batting fifth, the newcomer, center fielder, Charlie Warren. Batting sixth at first base, David McKinnon getting bumped up from the nine spot. Batting seventh, the shortstop, Preston Grand Prix. Batting eighth, the catcher, Jarrett Reinflesch after an off day last Kirk, night. And then batting State. ninth, another newcomer, third baseman, Mark Caraviotis. On the mound is Evan Anderson, a sophomore left-hander. Comes from Ole Miss, originally from Oklahoma. He's the tallest guy on this Harwich Mariners roster, standing at 6'5 on the mound. So a lot of length, and with that, you'd expect some movement coming from the left side. He delivers strike one, and now ball one. Pretty good hitter, too, in high school. Batted 420. The 1-1, one, one, sent on the ground to the left side. Low hop for Justice. He throws it across, though, in time for out number one. So last night we saw the Gateman posed in the sixth right. inning with a 2 nothing deficit, and they were able to battle back. In game one, down four runs, they battled back and made it a ball game, didn't ultimately pull that one out. So they have been down before, despite the fact that they are used to getting out first and scoring in these first few innings. But they've shown that they can showcase some resiliency at times, and that's exactly what they'll be looking for here. First pitch to Jabs misses just inside. The 1-0, hit foul down the left field line, back and out of play. Jabs our player of the game last night after going two for three, scoring a run, RBI, was on base three times with a walk, stole a base as well, his third of the year. Batting 385 on the year, five hits and 13 at bats, no extra base hits, two runs batted in and four walks. The 1-2. Swung on and missed. In the dirt, it'll require a throw. The throw is delivered uneventfully. And quickly two outs here in the bottom of the first. Now Darren Shepard, the designated hitter for the Gateman. Shepard batting 286 on the year, four hits and 14 at bats. An extra base hit, a double. Breaking pitch finds a strike zone. Anderson's e ERA, excuse me, inflated almost three times to that of its 2014 level during the college season. Went from 2.11 to 6.02. With that came a spike in batting average of his opponents. That nearly tripled as well. The count now one and two to Shepard. 
Three runs in the top of the first inning for the Mariners. Two of them unearned. Another first inning error by the shortstop Preston Grand Prix. The one two to Shepard. This is why. Mariners wearing their road grays, Gateman wearing their home whites. The 2-2 two -two to Shepard, fouled off a foot. Shepard has a shin slash ankle guard. Hopefully for him, that foul ball found it. Showcased a good swing there in that 2-2 two -two count. The curveball from Anderson looked to be a fairly decent one. Shepard, though, was on it. Waits a little bit longer. That's in play. The 2-2. Foul tip off the equipment of the catcher, Lidge, and back to the screen. Comes with the breaking ball again there, and so that likely now sets up an elevator fastball. A 2-2 two and two count has a strike to work with. Maybe he'll see if he can get Shepard to chase one high. Shepard looking to at least get aboard, extend this first inning, the 2-2. Foul tip again, again off the equipment of Lidge, and again back to the screen. Different ball boy, though, this time. And that's significant. Picking up the foul ball, yeah. Other than that, pretty much a carbon copy of the last pitch. Shepard steps in after receiving the sign, another 2-2. Got him swinging. So a 1-2-3 inning for Anderson. The Gatemen go down in order. At the end of one, it's Harwich 3, Wareham 0 on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Ryan Williamson hoping for better luck in the second inning after giving up three runs in the first. One of those runs earned, the other two unearned. But despite two strikeouts, allowing some hard contact. Ryan Lidge, the eight hitter and the catcher, stepping to the plate for the Mariners. Last name Lidge sound familiar? Yep, he's the cousin of former Philadelphia Philly, Houston Astro as well, Brad Lidge. Williamson from the windup delivers on the inside corner quickly 0 and 2. Williamson gets the sign and delivers the 0 2. Breaking pitch misses low. Lidge so far this season has been splitting time with the other catcher Michael Hernandez. Lidge more the defensive oriented one. Last season, last summer playing in the North Woods League, he was rated the number one overall defensive catcher. So his pitch framing and blocking abilities there, we'll see if he can supply the bat. One, two, got him. Strike three swinging, the third already through eight batters for Ryan Williams and there's one down in the second. So while Harwich has nearly eclipsed and reached their hit total in three games and already usurp their run total in three of those four games. They also have three strikeouts. So either all or nothing for this team. 1-0 with Deathridge thinking about bunting. He thinks better of it takes ball one. The 1-0 just missing outside, 2-0. And some more lineup talk as well for this Harwich team. He's been in left field for most of the season, in three out of the four games, that is, here today in center field as he vacates left. Sent up the middle to center field, another hit for the Mariners. That's hit number four, base runner number five, their first trip through the order. And you know what's funny is that Cooper Ferris wasn't buying Harwich's slow start. He said their coaching staff, which is led by Steve Engler in his 13th year, always finds a way to right the ship after the first few games. He said they always manage to compile a talented roster, and one that will hit. So Ferris not buying the early season struggles, at least at the plate, from Harwich. Nick Walker steps in with the runner going, then thinking better of it. Now with the pitch going to the backstop, he'll take second anyway. 
He took a few hard steps, perhaps saw Reinflesch noticing him, then stopped as if to turn back, and then when the pitch went to the backstop, the decision was made quite easy for him. And maybe that was the entire intent of that last play, to get off far enough to make Reinflesch take notice, and then once he did, either scamper back or, like Reinflesch did, he got distracted, and that allows him to take second base. We'll call it a stolen base because he was taking off initially, although I maintain he would not have gone. We are calling it a pass ball, the official scorer tells me. Always helpful to have everyone together up here in the press box. Ball misses wide, 2-0. The pitch to Walker, hit in the air, shallow right field. Jabs coming in, if he sees it, he'll catch it. He has it, too shallow for Deathridge to advance to third. And I was hoping Deathridge would challenge the arm there of Jabs because we haven't seen it showcased since that exhibition game. He let it loose, uncorked one, or two of them rather, in that game and gunned down two runners at the plate ever since. Maybe teams took notice. No one's tried to attempt and take the extra base, take another 90 feet on Jabs. In the second outfield flyout for Walker in two innings. Now Connor Justice, who got things going for the Mariners in the first with a single. Justice then stole second as Williamson ponders a back pick. No throw, though. He then stole second, scored on an error by the shortstop Grand Prix off the bat of Noisy. Justice squares to bunt, takes ball one. I think everyone may have sort of given up on that backdoor curveball from Williamson. It looked well out at the time, and the batter showing bunt pulling back, he obviously thought it was out, and I think the home plate umpire had similar thoughts. I think it was a little bit closer than everyone gave him credit for. Coach Lawler out to have a chat with his lefty. Two down here in the second. The runner at second would still be at first if not for the pass ball by Reinflesch. A dangerous part of the order though for the Mariners. The two, three, four in that lineup all scored runs in the first. Should mention that Coach Lawler, the pitching coach for the Gateman, his relationship with Williamson, a very good one. That's what brought Williamson back here for a second season, so we'll see if those words pay dividends. 1-0 low and away, but it finds the very corner of the strike zone, now even at 1-1. One one. Deathridge with a decent lead, shielded from us by the second base umpire dancing back and forth. The pitch to home is foul down the third base line. Not hit all that well, Caraviotis actually got a couple steps on it, but falling harmlessly in foul territory. And it was a great pitch by Ryan Williamson to get in on the hands of Connor Justice. That's really the only thing he could muster unless he severely inside outs that pitch. But that far inside, you're gonna break a lot of bats if you can locate there consistently. Williamson. Looking to avoid trouble here in the second. The one two to Justice with the runner going low in the dirt. There will be no throw. So the second stolen base in as many innings for the Mariners and Deathridge is 90 feet away. Picked a good pitch to run on too. Now he's two stolen bases, two caught stealing. So 50% for Deathridge, 50% as well for this entire Harwich team. Now the count 2-2 two, two to Justice, missing very badly, up and away, and the count full with Sheldon Noisy on deck. Another good crowd here in Wareham. What else are you gonna do on a Saturday night? Beautiful night for baseball, the 3-2 for Justice. Swung on and missed, he got him. So Williamson strands another runner on third, at the end of one and a half, though, Harwich three, Wareham nothing on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Harwich Mariners three nothing over the Wareham Gateman as we head to the bottom of the second. Our video broadcast is brought to you by Casa Cancun Family Mexican Restaurant. Visit www.casacancunwareham.com. 
The game went down in order in the first, so it will be four, five, and six here in the second. Sowers, Warren, and McKinnon. Sowers batting 333, five hits and 15 at bats so far this year. Anderson delivers a first pitch strike. It's chopped to the left side and bobbled by Adams. Recovering, throwing high, and it'll go back. Sowers staying at first. Probably a good idea with the catcher Lidge backing up. An E5 ruled on the play. Sowers takes first base, leadoff runner aboard. I think it was the right play by Johnny Adams to cut that ball off in the first place, but it looked like once he bobbled it, he seemed to rush everything from there, and hence the wild throw. Now Charlie Warren. He figures to take over center field, at least for the time being. Just arrived the other day. First pitch fouled straight back. Warren out of Rice University. It's worth mentioning that Charlie Warren likely won't overtake center field based on his defense alone. Shepard, who's DHing tonight, a very good defensive center fielder. Warren and all of Rice, for that matter, pretty shaky on defense in 2015. When things got bad for them, they got bad in a hurry. The team, though, still notched 21st straight year in the NCAA tournament, and Rice was a big part of that. Hit over 330, so a very productive year for him at the plate. 0-1, sent sharply to first, off the glove of Palmero. It'll go into no man's land, and everybody will be safe. A tough play for Palmero. Scored an infield single, and Warren's aboard. Moving Sowers to second, there's still nobody out. So right now we're seeing the developments of what happens when you get the leadoff runner aboard. The Gatemen have been very successful so far this season when they do just that. Ten out of a possible 12 times in which the leadoff runner has reached, that leadoff runner has come around to score, and they look poised to do that here with no outs on a runner in scoring position. Now David McKinnon taking a breaking pitch for a strike. He was the nine hitter past few games, but if you hit 417 like he has so far this year, you're going to find yourself making your way up in the order. Anderson, having allowed his first hit of the game, delivers a pitch. It's sent to left field down for a hit. Sowers rounding third, and the ball gets by Gonzalez. One run will score the throw into third, not in time. So an RBI single for McKinnon. Each runner advancing a base on the error by the left fielder Gonzalez, and the Gateman get one back. It's now 3-1. A lot of things happening there on that last play. First off, McKinnon stays hot at the dish. His barrel is finding a lot of baseball right now, and it was not a poor pitch at all by any means from Evan Anderson. It was on the inside portion, but McKinnon did a good job pulling his hands through the inside portion of the strike zone and bringing his barrel around with it. And then a big 90 feet there for Charlie Warren as he snagged third base on the air from the left fielder. Warren showcasing that speed that Wareham fans know very well. Last season with Wareham, he led this team in steals. And here right there, taking a 90 feet, that's big, especially when there are no outs. I only have one pair of eyes, but I believe Sowers would have scored anyway from second. I do not think Warren would have advanced to third or McKinnon to second. And the left field, Gonzalez, not made that error. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And so now two runners in scoring position. We'll see if Grand Prix can right some of his wrongs that he's been experiencing at the plate. The count 0-1 to Grand Prix. Ball one missing low and away. Grand Prix struggles at the plate. Not at all surprising. And for a freshman to come in here experiencing pitching against some of the best in the entire nation... Not all that shocking, only has one hit this year. Hits it to center. Deathridge setting up for a throw. Warren coming home from third. The throw is cut off. And the game and get another one back. It's now three to two. So when you're struggling at the plate, putting together good at-bats becomes even more important. That's exactly what Grand Prix did right there. Didn't try and do too much with it. Lifted it deep enough into center to score Warren from third easily. Now Jarrett Reinflesch with the tying run still standing at second base. Ball one misses high.
Three runs for the Mariners in the top of the third. Two back for the Gateman here in the bottom of the second. The 1-0 sent in the air to right center field. Walker and Deathridge converging. It's Walker. To throw to third. Enough to scare McKinnon away from trying to take third on the tag. And McKinnon has good speed too, so him going there wouldn't have been an atrocity by any means, but it makes sense for him not to go there. Two outs, those 90 feet don't make that great of a difference. He's likely scoring on a base hit anyway. Now the nine hitter, Mark Caraviotis. Caraviotis out of Oregon, a native shortstop but playing third base tonight. Struggled offensively as he takes strike one. Struggled offensively with the Ducks this year. <coughs> strike on the inside corner. I say struggled, but I guess batting 269 for a shortstop isn't all that bad. He is a defensive minded shortstop, though. Anderson with the 0-2 to Caraviotis. Hits softly left side in the infield. It's going to be a tough play for the pitcher, Anderson, and he drops it. A high hop, and Caraviotis will reach. An infield single for the speedy Caraviotis, and now runners at the corners with two down for the leadoff hitter, Tanner Kirk. And Caraviotis, Caraviotis that is, can certainly hold his own at the plate. 260, 269, that is, in the Pac-12. No slouch of a batting average whatsoever. The backstory on him, since we've given it to everyone else on this team here in the 2015 season for the Gateman, he earned the full-time starting position just 10 games into his freshman season. Started the final 50 of 54, so he's taken that spot and really run with it. I had formed my, I guess, ill-advised impression that he was not offensive-minded when I did my prep about two-thirds of the way through the season. So, wrapping up, and that one hits Kirk in the foot. He stays up, limping a bit, but he'll head to first, and the bases will be loaded for the two-hitter, Jay Jabs. So just like last night when the Gatemen find themselves in a deficit, their offense wastes no time in putting some runs on the scoreboard. And it all started with base runners getting on base. Sowers reaching on an air to start this inning. He did come around to score, so make that 11 of 13 opportunities when, in which the leadoff runners hit, and then he's come around to score. So a good job from the lineup, the rest of the lineup, in suing Sowers to bring him home. Jab struck out swinging in the first, now 5 for 14 on the year. He swings and misses at the first offering from Anderson, 0-1. Okay. Gateman looking to tie this game up, perhaps even more. Ball one misses outside. The runner at third, McKinnon. The runner at second, Caraviotis. The runner at first, Kirk. Two runs have scored here so far in the second. There was an error by the left fielder, Matt Gonzalez. Two and one now, although the error took place after a base hit. So not extending this inning, just allowing some runs to score more quickly than they would have otherwise. The two one to Jabs. Just missing the outside corner, it's three and one. One thing we've seen so far from Jabs is a pretty good eye at the plate. He's now struck out as many times as he's walked, four and four. The three one. Hit well to right field. Walker back. This one is gone, a grand slam for Jay Jabs and six runs for the Gateman here in the second. That was an absolute moonshot and we've been struggling determining the result of balls off the bats because they're wood and we're adjusting as well. As soon as Jabs hit that, I think we both knew that there was no doubt about that one. He absolutely crushed that pitch from Anderson who got just way too much of the plate for a bases loaded situation and Jabs certainly made him pay the price. There's only so many ways to describe something that was an absolute moonshot. <laughs> and I think that just calling it a bomb, a dinger, whatever you want to call it, will suffice. 6-2 Gateman. Shepard, the nine hitter, fair ball down the left field line. He has one, he wants more. Into second, 
The throw cut off. So Shepard with a double on the first pitch after the grand slam by Jabs. When it rains, it pours, I guess. Not hit particularly well off the bat of Shepard, but got a few good bounces and then found that third baseline. He's in there for a double. Things happening quickly here in the second. The Gateman entered this inning down 3 nothing, But so far, six runs. Fielder number nine, Logan Sowers. Logan Sowers began this inning by grounding to third. There was an error by the third baseman, Johnny Adams. That was the first of two errors this inning. Two down, the runner, Shepard at second. First pitch swinging, gets a swing and a miss. And I didn't want to say anything at the start of this game, especially with Harwich struggling offensively, but this really had all the makings of an offensive outburst, a very high scoring game for both teams. And three runs for Harwich, if that sticks, won't be considered extremely high scoring. Hit sharply to short, it's bobbled by the shortstop Justice. The runner coming home from second, he'll score. Throw to first, not in time. It's another error for the Mariners, their third this inning. And the score now 7-3. to three. And back to my point, neither of these pitchers have the pedigree of some of the other guys we've been seeing so far. Ian Hamilton, a very highly touted prospect, as is Dalton Jeffries. Anthony Kay, of course, Team USA. The two of these guys, their numbers don't really back up the superstar prospect hype that many of these players entail. Charlie Warren just avoids a fastball inside. It's 1-0. So Sowers reaching on an error for the second time this inning. And now Warren, who singled earlier in this inning and ended up scoring. The 1-0, chopped up the middle. Biggio with the glove to his hand, throws on to first, and that'll do it for the Gateman in the second. But they strike gold, scoring seven runs. At the end of two, it's Gateman seven, Mariners three, on WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. The Gateman with seven runs in the bottom of the second. On only five hits, they benefited from three Mariner errors. First pitch swinging, rip to left. It'll get past the left fielder Sowers and go all the way to the wall. A first pitch double for Sheldon Noisy. And you just knew the Mariners were not going to go gently into the good night. Three runs in the first. The first Leaving a runner at third on second, and now a leadoff double for Noisy here in the third. Now this is going to be a fun game, especially for you to call. A lot of highlight reel stuff just flowing in. Already 10 runs scored for both teams, and the leadoff runner on for Harwich here in the third. First pitch into Preston Palmero is a strike. Although the result not desired, you'd like to see Williamson throwing the pitch across the plate, now with a four-run cushion. Check swing foul, and the count quickly 0-2. And in case you were wondering, cuts likely going to be made after Sunday's doubleheader, which means some of these guys will be sent home. They'll no longer be with the Gateman. Ryan Williamson, though, he's not fighting for his life. A full contract player and so the coaching staff likely going to let him iron out all the kinks and any kinks here in his start today. The 0-2, a breaking pitch, misses high and in. Palmero singled and scored in the first. Looking to, at the very least, advance the runner noisy from second. 1-2, fouled back. If you're just joining us, three runs for the Mariners in the first, seven runs for the Gateman in the second, highlighted by a grand slam off the bat of Jay Jabs. The one, two to Palmero, got him swinging. So Palmero retired for out number one, and Williamson gets out number one without sacrificing a base to the runner at second noisy. A good job responding there by Williamson after giving, off the, giving up the leadoff double, pulling the hook, pulling the string on that breaking ball, 
getting Palmero swinging. Now already for Williamson, already five strikeouts in this ball game. A big secondary lead for Noisy. Had that ball gotten any further away from Ryan Flesh, he might have gone for third. Five strikeouts already through two and a third innings for Williamson. Yeah, but you are right. Johnny Adams struck out looking his first time up. The 1 0. Sent broken bat to short. Grand Prix scoops it, fires it, out number two. The runner advancing to third. Williamson just sawed off the bat of Johnny Adams. So much so that the barrel of it, and I think about 80% of the bat, went flying back and hit the backstop right behind home plate. A good pitch there by Williamson to find the inner hands of Adams and get the ground ball out. Now Kevin Biggio with the big blow in the top of the first, a two out, two run double. The score runs number two and three in the inning. First pitch misses low in the dirt, nice block by Reinflesh keeping that in front of the plate. Heck of a block there by Reinflesh, and that's a, an incredibly difficult pitch to block. The short hops are one thing and you can practice those all you want, but when a ball bounces that far in front of home plate, it's anyone's guess where it's going. The 1-0. Off-speed pitch, just missing outside, 2-0. Williamson trying to strand a runner on third for the second consecutive inning. The 2-0 to Biggio, missing wide ball three with Matt Gonzalez on deck. We'll see what Williamson delivers on 3-0 to the dangerous Biggio. He misses wide ball four. Not all that unexpected, at least to me. The guy takes you to the wall with a two-run double in his first at bat, and you have an open base to put him with two outs. You don't want to tempt fate twice. And especially with the scouting report that's available to these teams on Biggio, not an unknown player at all. Everyone knows that he swings a very powerful bat. He's your typical three hitter here today, though, bumped down to number six. But in that spot in the lineup, he's dangerous. Ball one missing inside. One oh, broken bat to third. Carviotis char charging, throwing across in time for out number three. So Williamson gets into a jam, but gets out of it too. At the end of two and a half, it's 7-3, Gateman over the Mariners. We're now joined by Megan O'Brien, who has more on the new additions to the Gateman roster. Thanks, Eric, and that's right. There are some new additions to the Gateman roster. Charlie Warren just arrived two days ago. He had lost his luggage at the airport, but was slotted in the lineup today after settling in yesterday. I had the chance to catch up with him. He told me he learned a lot from his experience here last year and was able to implement that back at Rice. He's still looking to get a bit of a stronger bat, and manager Cooper Ferris told me do not be surprised if Warren is slotted in the first two slots of the lineup tomorrow because of his speed. So look forward to seeing more out of more of the speed of Charlie Warren. And before I send it back to you guys, we have to give a shout out to Casa, Casa, we have to give a shout out to Casa for the food that they provided today. It was delicious for everybody and we'll send it back to you upstairs. I've had Casa Cancun and it was good. We did post game meals with the team, but always nice to have a snack before the game. We're going to sneak in a couple more commercials here and come back. You're listening to the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Is your oil heating system old and in need of replacement? Consider converting from oil to propane with Eastern Propane and Oil. Visit warmuptopropane.com to learn more about how you can save with Eastern Propane and Oil's current incentive program. And we're back quickly and it's playing field. Gateman 7-3 over the Harwich Mariners as you head to the bottom of the third. A reminder that you can give us comments, questions, smart remarks by emailing pressbox at gateman.org. We check it periodically throughout the game and 
Although for the past few nights, it's been to detail technical difficulties. Looks like everything's up and running tonight. Both of us are on Twitter as well, so if you feel like submitting any comments that way, feel free to do just that. The 1-0 to David McKinnon. Hit well to left. Gonzalez back, looking up. It's gone! David McKinnon with his second hit of the game, the second home run of the game for the Gateman, and the score now 8-3. to three. Stay hot, David McKinnon. My goodness, he is seeing the ball right now, and we talk about adjectives that the ball may be appearing to people. Really big, if that helps at all. Right now, we described someone earlier as a watermelon. I think it's now a pumpkin for David McKinnon. Third straight multi-hit game in a row for him. Had a two for four day against Hyannis, two for three against Bourne, and now two for two in his two plate appearances here today. He's seeing the ball great right now and putting barrel to ball. Preston Grand Prix takes a strike. In one plate appearance on the day, he had an RBI sacrifice fly as you see a fan coming up with that ball. 1-0, chopped on the ground left side. Easy for Adams. Throwing across, out number one. So after seeing one home run in the first four games, the Gatemen have two through two and a third innings so far tonight. The, the Gatemen pitching staff also yet to allow a home State. run outside the park. There was an inside the park home run on Thursday night. First pitch hits the outside corner strike one. But that was a tough play and with McKinnon going back no, not McKinnon, excuse me, it was uh, Shepard. Deep in the hole at short, Grand Prix, excuse me, Justice throwing across, out number two. So now Caraviotis, singled and scored, and he's only a bat in the second. One of seven Gateman to score in that inning. Taking a look at the scorebook right now, Everyone for the Gateman has reached, aside from Grand Prix and Ryan Flesh, the seven and eight hitters. Everyone's reached and everyone's score, that is. So seven of the nine batters in this lineup have reached base in some facet and then come around to score as well. Pitch misses low. Count one and one. Count one and one to Mark Caraviotis. Missing high, ball two. <laughs> two one. Sent foul and out of play. The Gateman with seven runs in the second, one so far in the third on a solo shot by David McKinnon. McKinnon jumping from the nine spot to the six spot, perhaps turning himself into a power hitter as this one hit weakly to third. Adams with a tough play, throwing across, gets him by a half step. Nice play by Adams to end the third inning. But in the inning, a solo home run by David McKinnon extends the Wareham Gateman lead to 8 3 over the Harwich Mariners. You're watching WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. The Gateman leading 8 3 as we head to the top of the fourth. Looks like the Gateman bullpen has started a bonfire out there. Last night, post game, Bailey Clark, the pitcher, <laughs> told me he would make me a s'more. S'more of what? You're killing me, Garcia. And also the clever choice of songs as well. I hope our listeners caught that. Oh, that was all for our listeners. Ball one misses inside. Strike one hits the outside corner count now one and one. Williamson out to begin his fourth inning of work. After giving up three runs in the first inning, he settled down nicely. Thanks in part, I suppose, to having now a five-run cushion to work with. Check swing. He went. Count now one and two. Lidge lines it right up the middle. A leadoff single for the Mariners. They have their leadoff hitter on for the second time in two innings. 
And already this Harwich Mariner team, not even through four innings yet, has already passed the amount of hits they have amassed in their past three games. Five hits in game two, five in game three, and five in game four. And six already here tonight. They're still striking out at an enormous rate, which is never a good thing. But at least they're putting the ball in play and it's finding open grass for them. Brock Dethridge singled, got as far as third in the second, advanced to second on a pass ball, and then stole third himself. The 0 1 from Williamson squaring to bunt. It's in the air. Ryan Flesh has it. He puts it away for out number one. Ryan Flesh behind the plate showing some agility, springing out of that crouch and camping under the popped up bunt, putting it away for the first out. If you're Brock Dethridge at the bottom of this lineup, turning it over to the top, and a top that's been very good so far for this Harwich team, you have to get that bunt down there. Your job is to come up, sacrifice your at-bat, and get the runner over. Anything in the air is no good. You'd rather bunt the ball straight back to the pitcher, hard at a fielder, than give the defense an easy out with a pop-up. The 1-0 to Nick Walker is 0-2 on the day. Two outfield flies, one to center, one to right. You're under at first, Lidge. Chopped foul towards the Mariner dugout. And, of course, Stetheridge knows that, and I'm sure he's kicking himself right now in the dugout for popping that bunt out. But it's just concentration in the batter's box. If the pitch is above your hands, don't bunt it. Pull back. If it's there, you have to aim for the top of that baseball. 1-1 one, one to Walker. Missing high and in, ball two. Looks like someone's trying to put the kibosh on that bonfire out in the right field corner. <laughs> Can't understand why. Count now three and one. The runner at first, Lidge, the three one, missing low ball four. So Walker aboard with one out. He moves Lidge to second. And now Connor Justice, one for two on the day, singled and scored the game's first run back in the first, then struck out swinging in the second. Ryan Flesh having a chat with his pitcher, and now Lawler coming out as well to join. Gateman with seven runs in the second, one in the third. They've scored the last eight runs after the Mariners got three in the first. And if you're Lawler, who we've already established has a good relationship with Williamson, you're out there for the second time in four innings. And all you really want to see your pitcher do is throw strikes, which he did not do in that last at bat to Walker. With a five-run lead, there's no reason not to be aggressive. Exactly, and especially with a team in Harwich that strikes out so much. If you're around the zone, you're likely going to miss some bats. It's not that difficult of a task. And it looks like after a discussion, we're going to have a pitching change. So we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll give you more on the new Gateman pitcher. Back at Spillane Field, the Gaten with an 8-3 lead over the Harwich Mariners. But they're making a pitching change here in the top of the fourth with two runners on and one out. Ryan Williamson went three and a third, gave up three runs, one of them earned. He's responsible for the two runners on base. And Jace Van Senna in the game. Van Senna a righty, as opposed to Williamson, who he's replacing, who was a lefty. And so... <laughs> now Megan O'Brien wants to dissect what's going on over there in the bullpen, a place where Vincenna just came from. So, Megan, take it away. Thanks, Jake. There's been action going on in the bullpen, warming up, bringing a new pitcher for the Gateman. But there's also some more action. There was a fire started in the right field bullpen. I just talked to Zach Houston. He told me he started the fire. I asked him, where would you learn how to start fires? And he said, Megan, everybody in the South knows how to start a fire. And it's not only good for killing the bugs, but the Gateman bullpen is having a nice snack. They have made s'mores out in the right field bullpen. So if you're hungry, maybe stop by and see if those pitchers will let you have one. Back to you guys. 
had a song, Zach Houston didn't start the fire. <laughs> if, in case anyone didn't know, the way to make a proper s'more is to roast the mallow, <laughs> smother that mallow in chocolate, and then place the mallow on the gram. Of course. And yeah. then what? And then stuff. Then you stuff. Thank goodness we had such a long pitching change so we could... That was breaking talk, news. Talk that was about breaking news. The bonfire <laughs> down the right field line in the Gateman bullpen. First and second for Van Senna. One down and Connor Justice at the plate. 71 pitches for Williamson in that outing. Not even making it through four innings, so an elevated pitch count for him. A bit sporadic. And now it'll be the job of Jace Van Senna, freshman pitcher. Drafted out of high school, but opted to go to Michigan. And in a high profile and a pretty tough situation with two runners aboard. Looked like an off-speed pitch, first pitch delivery. You don't see that very often with a new pitcher coming into the game. Came out of his hand a little funny. So although we don't know much about Van Senna, we'll talk to our Major League Baseball scout coordinator, Brian Shropshire, and try and get the lowdown on him during the break. 1-0 misses low and away ball two. I'll give you my notes. 2-1, 17 appearances, 44 innings out of Michigan's pen. 21 strikeouts, 17 walks, so not as big as a gap as you'd like. But rated the second best prospect in the Big Ten for the 2017 draft. A temporary player here for the Gateman. 2-0 to Justice, gets a swing and a miss, 2-1. He's a Big Ten guy, which means I can relate to him, although I never saw him play, at least not this year. You're from Arizona State, you grew up in California, so you know a lot more of these guys. I geeked out last night when Big Ten player and Minnesota native Ryan Bolt came to town. and It's kind of fun to see some Big Ten guys. we got to stick together. 2-1, missing low in the dirt. Another nice stop by Ryan Flesh, who's been pretty good this evening. Well, Big Ten baseball isn't... I mean, it's not that low profile. Tracy Smith, Indiana's coach, just came to ASU, and he's, a, he's one of the best baseball coaches I've seen. The dude knows his stuff. The Big Ten, a very, very strong baseball season this year. Illinois, Maryland, both making deep runs into the college baseball tournament. Illinois having the nation's longest winning streak as well this season. But I think just for proximity's sake, you see a lot of those players come out to the North Woods League. Popped up in the infield. Grand Prix taking charge, as he should, as the shortstop. He puts it away for out number two. The designated hitter, number 16, Sheldon Noisy. Now Sheldon Noisy, who's reached twice in two at-bats, reached on an error by the shortstop Grand Prix in the first, came around to score, then doubled to lead off the third, but then he didn't get any farther than that. The runner at second, Lidge. The runner at first, Walker. New pitcher Jace Van Senna trying to pitch out of a jam. First pitch misses wide ball one. Van Senna's height on the mound, he stands at 6'5", really gives him a downward straight over the top motion. And that can sometimes result in some pretty flat pitches, but at the same time it'll add a few miles an hour onto his fastball. Another ball, another one wide for Van Senna, and it's 2-0. Van Senna came in after the walk to the leadoff hitter, Walker. That filled first base and put runners at first and second and one out. So far, he's gotten an infield pop-up, but he's behind in the count 2-0 to Sheldon Noisy. High fastball, left up, fouled back to the screen, and Noisy looking back our way. With a grimace on his face, he knew that was a pitch he should have hit hard somewhere. Yeah, that was a fastball up and in from Van Senna. And on a 2-0 and count, you have to attack the plate there. Noisy took a big hack at it, and he was on it too, but didn't square it up, didn't put it in play as he fouled it straight back. The 2-1 to Noisy, missing low and away, ball three with the dangerous Preston Palmero, the cleanup hitter, waiting on deck. Gateman with a five-run lead here in the fourth, but they want to keep it that way. 
Van Senna checks the runner at second and delivers the 3-1. Off-speed pitch gets a swing and a miss. And again, Noisy <laughs> has a few words with himself. Himself takes a stroll out of the batter's box. Looked like that breaking ball, if it, I think it was one from Van Senna, hung a little bit more than he had wanted to, and Noisy took a very powerful hack. I would have guessed it a changeup, but regardless, a pretty gutsy move to throw it on 3-1. An account in which Noisy was reasonably so, expecting a fastball, the 3-2, missing low and away, ball four. So the base is now loaded for Preston Palmero. Palmero, one for two on the day, singled and scored in the first, struck out swinging in the third. Palmero out of North Carolina State. One of two sons of very good major league hitters. Palmero, the four hitter. Kevin Biggio, the six hitter. Ryan Lidge, the eight hitter. <laughs> His relation, not a hitter, but... Yeah, and tertiarily, not the son of Brad Lidge, former closer. Strike one finds the zone. Breaking pitch misses wide ball two. Excuse me, ball one. I'm not sure if Van Senna has more in the tank than what he's showing right here, but his motion is really effortless. And with a big frame like that, if he reared back and whipped it in there a bit more, I feel like he could add a few miles per hour onto that fastball. And even the breaking stuff too, if he fired his arm a little bit more, maybe get some more movement on it. He has that big frame. Having some issues controlling his pitches as it is after a two-out walk. It's 2-1 to Palmero. It's sent foul off the screen of the Gateman dugout. And maybe it's not that he's not using all of his body that he has. Maybe it's just a more refined, a more controlled delivery. And that's not a bad thing. Right. In fact, it bodes well for his future. So many times you see people with violent deliveries to the plate end up getting hurt, be it their elbow, their shoulder, even their core, if it takes a, a lot of torque to get to the plate. The 2-2 two -two to Preston Palmero. Just misses the inside corner. A close pitch. Van Senna wanted it. Reinflesch wanted it. Palmero doing a good job laying off of it. The count now full. The runners will get an early break. And Adams awaiting on deck. A tough pitch to take with two strikes. Anything close like that again, I'd expect Palmero to be hacking. The 3-2 to Palmero. Sent down the left field line, foul, and out of play. Both runners, all three runners actually, in motion, but the runner at third, understandably taking a bit of a, a leisurely time getting started because you don't want to end up too close to the plate. Could wind up taking a baseball to the teeth and obviously something that wants to be avoided, so he'll stray back a little bit as his counterparts on the bases go. 3-2 to Paul Mero. To the right side, diving stop by Kirk, comes up, firing in time to get him. Van Senna and the Gateman escape a bases loaded, two out jam. A nice play by Tanner Kirk, preventing that ball from getting into right field. At the end of three and a half, it's Gateman eight, Mariners three on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back at Spillane Field, the Gateman with an 8-3 lead over the Harwich Mariners. Mariners got the first three. Gateman have gotten the next eight. And a nice play by Tanner Kirk wrapping up that top of the fourth inning. We talked about how Cooper Ferris talked about that Charlie Warren would be almost guaranteed a spot at the top of this order. But with Kirk swinging a great bat, Jab's obviously a grand slam in this game, and then you saw that last inning, Kirk's excellent defense. Where is Warren going to slot in the start of this lineup? You don't want to change something that's working, at least in my opinion. I don't know, but it's a good problem to have, not one that the Gatemen have had to struggle with the past two years. 1-1 to Tanner Kirk. It's a cliche, but 
How many times do you see it? The guy makes a great play to end the top half of the inning and comes up to lead off the bottom of the inning. Sent on the ground to the left side. Adams comes up with it, throws across, out number one. But it looked like since you pointed that out, he's not going to get that good fortune because the baseball gods don't reward someone who tries to point out luck. The Cavemen not complaining. They have a five-run lead already. Jay Jabs last time up. Brought four home, including himself. A grand slam, the second home run of the Gateman season, the first of Jabs's, And that gave the Gateman the lead. Score was 3-2 at the time. Quickly turned into 6-3 as ball one misses wide. Anderson delivers. Off-speed pitch, sent back. Strike one. Talking with Cooper Ferris before the game, we asked him to pinpoint and highlight one thing in which you want to see your team improve upon. Of course, the Gateman 3-1, and one, so playing some good baseball, not great baseball to start this season off. He wanted more consistent at-bats, more walks, fewer strikeouts. Here today, two strikeouts in the first inning, but none since then for this Gateman team. No walks either, but they'll certainly take the consistent at-bats that they've rolled together here today. 2-1 to Jabs is fouled back. It's 2-2. Two and two. Anderson to Jabs. Missing inside. It hits him. Just glancing him on what looked to be the elbow or the forearm area. And Jabs is aboard for the second time. I guess he's aboard for the first time. The first time he got a hit, he rounded the bases. He didn't stop. But semantics aside, he's at first. Darren Shepard stepping to the plate. He doubled on the next pitch after the Jabs Grand Slam and came around to score on an error by the third baseman, Johnny Adams. He squares to bunt. It's right back to the mound. Anderson looking at second instead going to first. He gets Shepard by a step. And now with two down, Jabs is in scoring position. Looked like Shepard was trying to bunt there for a base hit. So, in the scorebook, probably, at least I'm not going to be ruling that a sacrifice bunt. Nor will I. The placement of it was pretty poor, too. That doesn't go in the, into the scoring decision, but kind of fortunate there for Shepard that the pitcher Anderson didn't fire on to second base. And now we're being told that it is indeed a sacrifice. First pitch to Logan Sowers. Missing wide ball one. So much about baseball is trying to gauge intent. And you, we likely could have made the case that Jabs being hit by a pitch, he didn't make the intent of getting out of the way of that pitch. And the umpire, it's up to his discretion. Logan Sowers gives it a ride to deep left field. Gonzalez backing, tracking. It's off the wall. One run will score. Sowers into second. An RBI double for Logan Sowers. He's aboard for the third time in the game. First with the hit, and now it's 9-3 Gateman. We've seen Anderson so far in this game consistently attack the inner portion of the plate, and the Gateman offense has consistently made him pay for doing just that. The home run that came off the bat of Jabs on the inner portion, as well as a few other hits, specifically the home run from McKinnon was on the inner half, and here Sowers does exactly what everyone else has, hands through the zone on the inside portion of the plate, Gets the bat head to the ball and deposits it, deposits it and forcefully hit as well. That ball was hit just as hard as the home runs by Jabs and McKinnon earlier. Just not enough altitude on it to get it out. The 1-0 to Charlie Warren. Hits the outside corner. 1-1. One one. So another run for the Gateman here in the fourth. I'm a bit surprised that Anderson is still out there. 1-1, one, one, low in the dirt, gets a swing and a miss, strike two. Yeah, that ERA of his not looking all too pretty right now. Nine runs in 3.2 three in innings. Although, there were three errors in that seven-run second inning, so I would imagine at least half of those, probably all the ones that scored on the Jabs Grand Slam that came with two outs, would be unearned. 1-2, tap foul. Only two earned Only runs. Only two earned runs so far. And looking at my scorecard, I would guess those would be the two that scored after that seven-run inning. 
the home run in the third off the bat of McKinnon and the RBI double that just happened that has Sowers at second. 1-2 to Warren. Some weak contact, but enough to flip it foul and keep the at-bat alive. Warren singled in the second, like many others. Came around to score and grounded out to second later in the inning. The one-two to Charlie Warren's strikeout swinging. It's going to require a throw to first. That happens without any incident. And that'll do it for the Gateman in the fourth. But they add one more on an RBI double by Logan Sowers at the end of four. It's 9-3 Gateman on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back at Spillane Field, the Gateman. Nine runs so far to the Harwich Mariners three. Looking for their fourth consecutive win. Something that for the past couple years was a foreign concept. Two really rough years after their championship season of 2012 and there's reason to be optimistic this year with even the temporary players for the Gateman doing well. And it's always tough to summer after summer bring in stellar recruiting classes which is what these coaches are exactly tasked with. And so sustaining success in the Cape is something that's extremely difficult. And we see that in this Harwich team. Last year, first place in the East, 26 and 16. They lost in the first round of the playoffs, but had the best overall record in the East. And here this year, it's early, yes, but for the most part, it's been a different story. Van Senna delivers a strike to Johnny Adams 0 for 2 on the day. Struck out looking in the first, grounded out to short in the third. Quickly 0 and 2. Van Senna not really bringing it heat wise, only dialing in his fastball at about 83 miles per hour. That courtesy, again, of our MLB scout liaison Brian Shropshire. 0 and 2 missing low. And we don't know what to compare that against. We don't know if he's just naturally soft tossing or, or if something is amiss. If he were injured, I'm sure he wouldn't be out on the mound right now, but maybe not going 100%. And his one and two misses just up and just away, two and two. The one thing it does, though, is it makes me wonder what his highly touted recruit background is based on. Obviously, he has the body of a potential at least professional at the very least, but fastball at 83, and then his off speed, only a difference of nine miles an hour. His off speed was clocked at 74. That's not enough to get it done. You'd like to see a bigger difference. 2-2 two, two check swing foul down the third baseline. Plenty of people have had successful major league careers throwing softly, but a lot of them left-handed, and a lot of them had more velocity in their younger days, and then stayed in the league as they got older. So, And his college numbers aren't bad by any means. 3.68 ERA at Michigan. That's so. the most important thing, really, the numbers against good competition. Sent on the ground to first, off the glove of McKinnon. It'll go into shallow right field. Kirk scoops it up at no play. That should go as an infield single. It was a really tough play for McKinnon. Trying to get in front of it, but a short hop off the, the glove. Second baseman, number seven, Kevin Biggio from Notre Dame. And it is a single. So McKinnon made a good effort. The short hop, though, got the best of him. And Adams aboard with the leadoff single. Biggio has reached base twice in two plate appearances. An RBI double that drove in two in the first. And then a walk in the third. A guy you really, really need to pitch carefully to. 1 0 misses up and in, ball two. The runner at first, Adams. He had an infield single just a moment ago. Mariners looking to get back into this game. They had an early 3 0 lead in the first. But the Gateman coming back with seven runs, none of them earned in the second inning. And then adding another in the third and another in the fourth. Count 3-0 to Biggio. Last time we saw Biggio in a 3-0 count, he
he was unintentionally intentionally walked or something to that effect. Instead of grooving a fastball, the pitcher at the time, Ryan Williamson, decided to tease the corner, see if he would chase. He didn't, and he ended up drawing a walk. This time a fastball splits the plate in half, and it's 3-1. and one. And it seems like Biggio profiles as a little bit different hitter than his dad was. His dad, gap to gap, spray the ball over the field. Biggio, though, looks like he swings a pretty powerful bat, more of your prototypical three-hitter. 3-1 three, to Biggio, ball four, second walk in as many at-bats for Biggio. And with nobody out here in the fifth, first and second for the Mariners. And maybe it's just what we've seen out of these Wareham pitchers here tonight, but from what we have seen, pitchers do fear him and respect him as a very capable power threat in the lineup. Matt Gonzalez, 0 for 2 on the day, struck out swinging in the first, grounded out to third to end the third. First pitch from Van Sena, chopped on the ground to the left side, diving stop by Caraviotis, off his glove, over to Grand Prix, throw to first, not in time. Almost a web gem as the ball glanced off the glove of Caraviotis, went right to Grand Prix, deep in the hole at short, but the throw not in time to get the speedy Gonzalez, and now the bases are loaded. Grand Prix was going in that direction anyway just because the ball was hit over there, and in the event that Caraviotis didn't get a glove on it, I'm not sure if Grand Prix would have been able to field it on a backhand, but it works out for him that he was covering on the play because then that ball just bounced right directly to him and pretty much saved a run. The six-run lead that the Gatemen currently have could get a lot smaller if Jace Van Senna and his defense isn't careful. First pitch to Ryan Lidge is a strike on the outside corner. He struck out his first time up, then singled to lead off the fourth, got as far as third base before he was stranded. The runner at third, Adams, reached on a single. Runner at second, Biggio, reached on a walk. The runner at first, Gonzalez, reached on a single as well. No ball has left the infield so far. The 0-1 is dribbled foul towards the Mariner dugout. Vincenna's not exceptionally fast movement or velocity on his fastball can either be perceived one of two ways from this Harwich team. Either you get things like results, like what just happened, and off the end of the bat, nub shots, or it's batting practice, in which they tee off. The 0-2 to Ryan Lidge. High breaking pitch left up and fouled back. A dangerous pitch on 0-2, usually on 0-2. If you're going to throw that breaking pitch, you want it away from the strike zone. But getting away with a bit of a mistake there is Van Senna, and the count's still 0-2. With the bases loaded, the 0-2 from Van Senna to Lidge got him. Strikeout swinging exactly what the doctor ordered, and there's now one out here in the top of the fifth. And that was a nasty pitch there from Van Senna. The bottom just completely fell off of that baseball. He pulled the string there and was able to notch a strikeout, and a big one, so when he needs it, he comes in and notches his first strikeout of his outing. Now Brock Dethridge, oh for, excuse me, one for two on the day, singled, got as far as third in the second, then tried to bunt in the fourth, and foul popped out to Ryan Flesh. He takes strike one. Again, the smell of bug spray wafting into our booth. A smell I... Rather enjoy right now, but I'll probably get sick of it as the summer wears on. The 0-1 to Deathridge. Hit well to right, it'll find grass. One run will score. The throw in from Jabs hits the cutoff man. One run scores on an RBI single from the nine hitter Brock Deathridge. The score now nine to four. And it wasn't a poor jump from Biggio on second base that caused him not to score on that play. It was just the nature of how hard that ball was hit from Deathridge, right at jabs in right field. He had All he had to do was field it on a hop and come up gunning, and the runner on third, or now the runner on third, Biggio, really smart for him not to be sent there to the plate. And now Nick Walker steps to the plate. Base is still loaded. The score now 9-4. to four. Walker 0 for 2 on the day, walked his last time up. His first two plate appearances were flies to the outfield. He'll probably take that now. 
if it's deep enough to score a run on a sacrifice. Time called. The runner at third, Biggio. The runner at second, Gonzalez. The runner at first, Deathridge. First pitch to Walker, misses low ball one. Game has slowed down considerably with the bases loaded. Van Senna comes to set and delivers the 1-0 to Walker, missing away ball two. And the problem in these situations when you don't have a fastball that ventures into the 90s is you can't come in and attack a hitter. You have to nibble, and as a result of that, you start to lose batters and hitters, and now a 2-0 count for the hitter, Walker. The 2-0 to Walker. He was waiting for a fastball. I think he got it, but he swung right through at the count 2-1. Van Senna trying to dig deep. The 2-1 to Walker, missing low and away, ball three. Again, Ryan Flesh staying busy tonight, keeps that one in front of him. So what's your go-to pitch right here if you're Van Senna? Your fastball has to be around the plate. If it's towards the middle, Walker's going to be expecting it, and he's going to be sitting on it. A curveball is risky, or a breaking ball, because there are three balls and you don't want to lose them. 3-1 to Walker. Chop to third. It could be two. Carviotis steps on third, throws across, not in time. So a run will score. The Gateman get an out. And now runners at first and second with two down for the Mariners. Interesting there that Carviotis wasn't playing at halfway depth. He just instead was playing deep for a third baseman and had to take a few steps to touch third base. If he were playing in or halfway, he could have gone to the plate and avoided the run that now makes this a four-run ball game. So Gonzalez forced out at third, the runner at second, Deathridge, the runner at first, Walker. Connor Justice to the plate, one for three on the day with a run scored. The runners go, squares to bunt, misses. In front of the plate, there will be no play. So a double steal perfectly executed, whether they intended it or not. Justice trying to bunt at that pitch. Instead, it's a strike, and the runners advance anyway. O one one to Connor Justice with two runners in scoring position. Pitch misses wide, one and one. The Mariners have gotten two back here so far in the fifth, but they have two more waiting on second and third. The 1-1 one -one from Jace Van Center to Connor Justice hits it. One and two. Chase Van Senna trying to avoid more trouble. The one two to Justice. Chopped to short. Grand Prix has it. Throws across in time. So the Mariners get two, but they leave two more. We're through four and a half. It's Gateman nine, Mariners five. We're now joined once more by Megan O'Brien, who has another piece of information for us. Megan? To me, turn it to me. You know, we were talking about Vincenna, and his velocities have been down. He was sitting... Um, low 80s, high 70s, and I talked over to the bullpen. And at Michigan, he usually sits at 90 to 92, so maybe something wrong with Jace Van Senna, but we'll keep you updated as the story progresses. Back to you. Thank you, Megan. We're going to head to break. You're listening to the Cape Cod Baseball League Network and watching WCTV. We're back at Spillane Field. The score a bit tighter than it was last time the Gateman batted. It's now 9-5, Wareham over Harwich. 
Six, seven, eight for the Gateman the in to face a new pitcher. Ten, it's Anthony Ciavarella who comes from Monmouth and a junior left-handed pitcher. Stands six foot, only 170 in this season at his respective college. 4-4-8 ERA in 61, 66 rather, and a third innings pitch. 53 strikeouts, 20 walks for him. David McKinnon, two for two on the day. Homered his last time up. He takes the 1-0, low and in, 2-0. McKinnon with two RBI so far on the day. Singled, scored, drove in a run in the second. As this one's sent to shallow right field, it'll find some green. High hop for the right fielder, Walker. But hit number three for David McKinnon, who continues his hot streak. There was any question as to who's going to be receiving a majority of the reps, at least in these next few games at first base, whether it be between Matt Kozik or David McKinnon. McKinnon has certainly solidified his role over there at first. He combines a very speedy game. He had seven stolen bases this past season and now swinging a very hot bat as well. Preston Grand Prix thinks about bunting, instead takes a strike. Grand Prix 0 for 1 in two plate appearances today. RBI sacrifice fly to center in the second. Part of that seven run second inning. McKinnon checked it first, he's back safely. Tonight we have a better sense of when the sun is going down and it, I believe it now has gone down behind the left field bleachers. Last night the fog was so thick we couldn't even tell. Ball outside, back pick to first, not handled by Palmero, no matter. McKinnon was back there anyway. The fog last night prevented some very stellar interviews from being crystal clear <laughs> at the end of the game. That won't be a problem tonight. We'll get Again, we'll get Cooper Ferris, head coach of the Gateman, as well as the player of the game. I was a magnificent green blob last night. The count one and two to Preston Grand Prix. The delivery got him swinging. So Grand Prix retired for out number one here in the fifth. Still waiting for Preston Grand Prix to break out at the plate. I thought there was one coming when he notched two walks, but two walks in a few games ago, and that hasn't materialized into much ever since those two walks. He's 0 for 5, so still trying to discover the form that made him Cal's go-to guy at the bottom of their lineup this past season. Strike on the outside corner to Jarrett Reinflesh, 0 for 2 on the day. Ciavarella delivers. Swung on and missed 0-2. And, Fans being asked by Gateman players and staffers to participate in the 50-50 raffle. 0-2, missing low. That or they're just carrying a bucket around, maybe asking for food scraps or something for the post-game meal. That's what I'd be doing if I were them. Our post-game meal is supposed to be on the field tonight. It's been described as comfort food. So <laughs> we'll leave it up to the viewer to decide what that comfort food is. Sent foul down the third baseline, one and two. That fire down the right field line has gotten bigger. I can now see the flame before I could just see smoke. Now. It's a full-on fire. And I had nightmares last night, and it certainly haunted me that I didn't point that out in yesterday's broadcast. And I noticed it. It just happened to me at a very poor time in this ball game, in which a lot of action was going on. So I reasoned I'd come back to it at a later point, and then it completely slipped my mind. Here tonight, that thing is bigger than ever, though, and the bullpen players staying warm, keeping the bugs away as well. The actual bullpen mound itself is behind the right field fence, as you can see there. We can't see who's warming up. One, two misses low. Or if anyone's warming up for that matter, just some faint silhouettes. But the bench itself in foul territory, and we can certainly see that and the fire. The two, two, sound on the ground to third. Adams to second for one. 
on to first. Got him double play. So Rhineflesh wraps into a double play to end the fifth. At the end of five, it's Gateman nine, Mariners five on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back at Spillane Field, new pitcher for the Gateman, Michael Adams, with the Gateman leading 9-5. to five. Another reminder that the broadcast crew would like to thank Casa Cancun Family Mexican Restaurant for the amazing food before the game. Check out their menu at www.casacancunwareham.com. So far, I've had their enchilada, their tacos, refried beans, rice, churro. I tr I'm not very good at rolling my R's. So I, I sometimes go to the standby churro, but I'm being ambitious on the air tonight. Can you do it? I can help you out with that, certainly. It's pronounced churro. Churro. And it's always great receiving quality Mexican food on the East Coast, coming from Central California, where that's a staple of my diet. Getting it back here on the East, a friendly reminder that home isn't as far as it actually is. Still waiting on that tater tot hot dish from Minnesota, <laughs> but I don't know. Mike Adams, the new pitcher, a junior right-hander. Stands only 5'11", 155 on the mound, but a very violent delivery to the plate. He's a hard thrower. This year at Wagner, though, success was something that he struggled to obtain, a 5.59 ERA. His team had success, though, ended up finishing second in the Northeast Conference. 1-2, two, missing inside, 2-2. Two and two. The first we've seen of Mike Adams so far this season. Gateman trying to solve Sheldon Noisy, who's reached all three times in his three plate appearances. Reached on an error and scored in the first, doubled in the third, and walked in the fourth. 2-2, two, two, check swing. Appeal down the first. He did not go, and the count runs full with Paul Marrow on deck. Three two chopped to the left side off the glove of the third baseman Caraviotis, and it'll trickle into left field. Big turn by Noisy, but he'll be content with one base. Not sure if that'll be called an error or a hit, but Caraviotis again a natural shortstop having some trouble at third base tonight. Yeah, and you wonder if that change of scenery for him for him is at all jarring. You shouldn't figure it to be. The ball is coming off the bat at the same angle, but slightly different movements. You uh -oh. hit well to right field. Palmero sends it out of here. Preston Palmero with a two-run jack, a no-doubter. And the score now 9-7, Gateman. Palmero, the former Gateman himself, exacting some revenge on his former team. That was a swing reminiscent of Rafael Palmero. No doubt about that one. That was even more of a bomb than the one Jay Jabs hit on a very similar line. I think Palmero may have bested him, though. That was an absolute shot. So after Wareham scoring nine runs in innings two through four to take a 9-3 lead, the Mariners get the next four, and it's now a two-run game. 0-1, hits the lower fringe of the strike zone, 1 and, excuse me, 0-2. Oh the 0-2 to Johnny Adams, missing in the dirt, 1 and 2. So af after seeing one outside the park home run in the first four games this year, we've now seen two for the Gateman and one for the Mariners. Fouled. I think that hit the bat twice as it trickles out of play. Still one and two. And as closer and closer as this game gets to nearing its finish, the Gatemen are more on that in a second. Hit sharply to Kirk. He recovers after it bounces off his glove. He has time to retire Adams. Nice play by Kirk, his second in as many innings. So Mike Adams giving up a pair of hard-hit balls right there. 
Adams hit that one right on the screws, and Kirk did a good job just keeping that in front and using his body, knocking it down and firing on to first. Now Kevin Biggio, he's reached all three times, only one at bat. That was a two RBI double in the first. He's walked two times since in the fifth, coming around to score. Also the second time in two batters, in which my point was just blurred by what was happening at the dish. And three for three. Hit sharply <laughs> to first. McKinnon has it. He takes it himself for out number two. Let's see if I can squeeze this in before the next batter puts one in play. But it's deeper and deeper as we go into this ball game. And this score, obviously, a two-run ball game. Ian Hamilton, the you've called him the de facto closer for this team up to this point, he was used yesterday through five innings, so not available out of the bullpen for Wareham tonight. You're obviously thinking bigger picture, and you don't want to be chasing individual wins if it means not starting someone who needs innings under their belt. But just a fact here, Hamilton really the most experienced member of this bullpen group in the later innings, and specifically the ninth. That's a bridge that they will cross when they have to, I suppose. Count 1-1 one, one to Matt Gonzalez, one for three on the day. Singled his last time up, it's one and two now. The one-two hits sharply on the ground to Kirk. He has it again. Gathers it up, throws on to first for out number three. But two runs for the Mariners in the top of the six. Both of them coming on a Preston Palmero long home run to right. At the end of five and a half, Gateman holding on to a 9-7 lead. You're listening to WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back at Spillane Field, Eric Bremer joined by Jake Garcia and Megan O'Brien. Gateman with a 9-7 lead over the Harwich Mariners. We are in the bottom of the sixth inning. It'll be 9-1-2 for the Gateman. Caraviotis leading off, taking a strike. It's been a wild one. Three runs for the Mariners in the top of the first. Seven runs, all unearned for the Gateman in the bottom of the second. Adding one each in the third and fourth. Has strike two taken. And then... In the fifth and sixth innings, the Mariners adding two runs in each inning. That brings us to a 9-7 score. 0-2, Carviotis is retired quickly and without mercy by Ciavarella. You mentioned how those seven runs all unearned in that second inning. Don't want to give off the vibe, though, that the Gatemen didn't do anything at all and were completely relying on airs from the Harwich defense in that inning. There were three airs, but also five hits, and one of them was a grand slam. So the hits were there for the Gateman, and, of course, they were aided by some miscues defensively. Kirk takes inside ball one. Three home runs so far in this game. The grand slam that you mentioned by Jay Jabs in that seven-run second. A solo shot by David McKinnon for the Gateman in the third. As strike one taken. And then just this last half inning, Preston Palmero. Son of Raphael with a two-run shot, reminiscent of his old man, to bring us to a 9-7 game. Kirk 0 for 2 on the day. He reached in the second on a hit by pitch, came around to score on the grand slam. The 1-2 to Kirk, got him swinging. Second straight strikeout for Cia Varela. And there's two down here in the sixth. We don't have the velocities yet on Ciavarella, but he seems to be very confident in that fastball of his. A left-handed pitcher, and he comes into the zone and really pounds these hitters. Now has two strikeouts because of that fastball. And looking for a quick inning here for Harwich. Jay Jabs with four RBI in the game, all of them coming in the second. That'll bring his... Season total to six runs batted in. He takes a strike with a breaking pitch, finding the outside corner. Jabs began the season as a temporary player. He takes up and in ball one. Made his way onto the team, thanks, has to be in part at least, due to his performance in the Sunday night exhibition against the Newport Gulls. Didn't do anything at the plate, but threw two runners out at the plate from right field in two consecutive innings as he swings and misses at strike two. And Jabs experiencing success isn't something that's eluded him often. He had a significant turnaround in between his freshman and sophomore seasons. 
hit over 100 points higher for Franklin Pierce. Here for the Gateman, he's been a an offensive, really a spark atop this lineup so far. Taking ball two outside. The hitting, good. The base running, though he's been caught stealing twice, good. 2-2, two, two, right down the middle, strike three looking. Siavarella strikes out the side in the sixth. We head to the seventh with the Gateman still clinging to a 9-7 lead over the Mariners. You're watching WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. We are back at Spillane Field, 9-7, Gateman leading the Mariners. Mike Adams out to begin his second inning of work. It'll be 8-9-1 and one for the Mariners. Ryan Lidge, Brock Dethridge, and Nick Walker. Lidge takes away ball one. He's one for three on the day. Singled in the fourth, his other two times coming up, he struck out swinging. 1-0, misses wide, ball two. As this game progresses for Harwich, they've been putting better and better at-bats together. That was a mouthful to say, and... Through three innings, they had struck out five times. Since then, though, in the following four innings of play, they've only struck out once. That was one of our pregame talking points in every game so far, of course, just four games into the season. But in every game so far, the Mariners had struck out more times than they had reached base on a hit. 3-1 now to Ryan Lidge. A total of 42 strikeouts in four games for this team. 3-1 misses low and goes to the backstop. Lidge will trot down to first. That ball might have gotten stuck in the grill of the chain link fence behind home plate. Because the home plate umpire motioned for time and we heard some audible from Ryan Flesh just beneath us. Not that Lidge was going to advance to second base anyway. But a leadoff walk to begin the seventh inning. The Mariners have gotten their leadoff hitter on in every inning since the third. Although they did not score in the third and fourth, in the fifth and sixth they did, getting two runs apiece. It'll be a new Gateman pitcher when we come back, we'll have more information on that. You're watching WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Dekas has a long history of offering superior fresh cranberries to the retail trade under the Paradise Meadow brand. Nationally recognized for fresh cranberry products, Dekas is now building their dried cranberry product line by expanding to include traditional, organic, and reduced sugar versions under the Paradise Meadow brand. They've also introduced a line of Funny Face brand, all natural, 50% less sugar flavored dried cranberries for healthy snacking for children. You already know what it is! Now watch me whip, kill it. Now watch me nay nay. Okay. Now watch me whip, whip. Watch me nay nay. Why me do it? Now watch me whip, kill it. Watch me nay nay. Back at Spillane okay. Field, Gaten with a 9 7 lead over the Harwich Mariners. But the Mariners threatening here in the top of the seventh. A leadoff walk spells the end of the game for Mike Adams. And now Tyler Zombro on to pitch for the Gateman. It's interesting because talking to Cooper Ferris and asking him. Which guys from your bullpen that you haven't seen would you like to see more of? And he said, frankly, I've seen pretty much everyone, so I don't really have an agenda here tonight. Ironically, though, the past three pitchers in Van Sena, Adams, and now Zombro will be collecting their first outings here for the Gateman in 2015. All three are temp players, so all three are fighting for position spots on this roster. Zombro... A starter back at home at George Mason through 81 and a third innings as his first season as a weekend starter. I think I know what you're getting at. Zombro has not yet retired 
a batter. He did come into a game. He faced one batter, gave up a hit. And that hit later came around to score. So for all intents and purposes, Cooper Ferris has not seen him. Facing his second batter of the season, it's Brock Dethridge, the nine hitter, two for three on the day. He squares to bunt and misses. Lidge quickly scampers back to first. Dethridge's last time up with an RBI single, advanced to second, then stole third on the front end of a double steal, but was stranded. 0-1, oh, a bunt. This time hits him out of the box, I believe. And yes, he will be called out. And the runner will have to return to first. And yeah, that's the right call there from the home plate umpire. If you bunt that ball into fair territory and then touch it as you're departing the batter's box, and once you establish yourself out of the batter's box, exactly like Deathridge did, and the ball hits you, you should be called out. Now the umpire's having a conference. I saw the same thing the home plate umpire did, and that was that the ball hit him as he'd stepped out of the box. And the key thing here is that he was out of the box. Early in this game, we saw a ball that was double hit. And he wasn't ruled out because he stayed in the box. And so they're going to decide here that he was officially out of the box. And so now one out here in the top of the seventh. Coach Steve Engler not happy with that call, but I think it was the right one, at least from our vantage point. And in order to overturn that call, one of the umpires at second or first base had to see something and you're typically not going to make that call unless you're absolutely sure. Right. It's sort of like the instant replay system in football in which there has to be an overwhelming amount of evidence that the call in the field was wrong. And clearly, there wasn't an overwhelming amount of evidence. Nick Walker steps to the plate. Already his fifth plate appearance this evening. Yet to record a hit, but he's reached twice. In the fourth with a walk and in the fifth with an RBI fielder's choice. 0-1, clips the inside corner. Walker not happy about it, looking back in disbelief. And the count quickly 0-2. The 0-2 to Nick Walker, low in the dirt. Nice stop again by Ryan Flesh. Normally, that play made easier if you flip your glove the other way and block it with your chest protector. Ryan Flesh opted for the more difficult path, and he still came away with it. He slid over, and then some soft hands there allowed him to backhand it. The count now 1-2 and two to Nick Walker. The runner Lidge on first. Walker with a close take, just missing inside, although from our vantage point it was inside, getting some jeers from the crowd, but it looked like that one didn't paint the corner. It painted the chalk of the batter's box. And while the entire Harwich lineup has been susceptible to the strikeout here in 2015. Nick Walker has remained above that. Still no strikeouts for him. The 2-2 just low and inside. So the count runs full with Connor Justice waiting on deck. Justice, if Walker reaches, would represent the go-ahead run. Zombro comes to a set. And delivers home. Chopped foul down the third base line into the Mariner dugout. Interesting, I guess, that Lidge wasn't going on the 3-2 with only one out. It's more of an optional choice and something a speedy runner is more inclined to do. Lidge, a catcher, probably not very speedy. Another 3-2 to Walker with a runner going this time. Chopped to third. He's going to have to go to first. Caraviotis does the throw on target for out number two. But Lidge staying out of the double play by advancing to second. It would have been close either way because that ball was softly hit. But the fact that Lidge was taking off on the play ruled out any possibility of a double play. Walker probably, he does actually have some speed at the plate. So Caraviotis had to field and throw on quickly. And that's exactly what he did for the second out. Now Connor Justice, instead of representing the go-ahead run, is merely the tying run. Justice won for four on the day. His first time up, he singled, stole second, came around to score. 
Since then, he struck out swinging, popped out to short, and grounded out to short. Brian Flesh having a chat with his pitcher. And what you're saying is, Justice is the guy we have to get out. Noisy has made some noise here today. Palmero, that big fly back in the sixth inning. So attack Justice. Even though first base is open, you don't want to venture into the middle heart of this order with runners on base and runners on base poised to tie or take the lead. Although we talked pregame about how anemic this Mariners offense has been, everyone in the lineup so far has reached base and we're just in the seventh inning. He squares to bunt. It's fouled on the third base line. Had it been fair, it would have almost certainly been an infield base hit. Infield playing back with two outs. I don't think that threat of a bunt has swayed their positioning, though. With two down, you still want to be playing back, try and prevent the ball from going into the outfield. So now with the count 0-1, Zombro checks the runner. And delivers to Justice. Off-speed pitch gets a swing and a miss. It's a pretty thing to see when a pitcher can successfully pull a string like that. And now he has his entire arsenal at his disposal right here. He went fastball fouled off by a bunt, curveball slider, some sort of off-speed in that last pitch. Now with the big advantage, 0-2, he has a lot of options. He can go fastball high, breaking ball in the dirt, and trust his catcher, Ryan Flesh. The 0-2 to Justice, low and in. I don't mind that pitch on 0-2. You certainly don't want to give him a strike or anything to hit. And if you throw a pitch low and in, you can possibly, if that was intentional, establish a pitch, the next pitch, to be up and away. We'll see what happens here on 1-2. Zombro to Justice. Hit in the air. Shallow right field. It's going to be a long run for Jabs. And it drops in fair territory. Boy, I don't know about that. A run will come in. Justice into second, and Cooper Ferris is upset. Ferris, not sure who to argue with. It was the first base umpire's call. It bounced off the glove of Jabs as he was going into foul territory. And that wasn't close either. Jabs was one or two steps in foul territory. That is definitely a blown call. He was running so fast, though, that obviously a tricky call, and the umpire's not budging here, but, man, Jabs was in foul territory when that ball hit his glove. Fair is still out there. He's pointing at the place in which Jabs dropped the ball. It was in foul territory, at least from our vantage point. We're right behind home plate. If this gets any longer, Ferris might be asking the home plate umpire for a reevaluation. Looks like he'll be heading to the dugout. Not satisfied with what he heard. So a run scores. The tying run now stands at second base for the three-hitter Sheldon Noisy. Fair is still barking at the first base umpire. As soon as Jabs let that or watched that ball hit off of his glove, he assumed it was foul, really nonchalantly went over and picked it up. And so... He was assuming that the home plate umpires saw exactly where he was. Turns out, though, that his nonchalantness allowed now the tying run to venture on to second base. Definitely a misplay by Jabs. That's not what's in question. He did drop the ball. But from our vantage point, from Cooper Ferris's vantage point, and from pretty much everyone else who has a voice, that one was in foul territory as the 0-1 gets a swing and a miss. Quickly 0-2 to Noisy. But it was called a fair ball. It'll go as an E9 in the book. Lidge scores from second. And now Justice taking his place as the tying run. Nobody had a better view of it than the first base umpire. The 0-2 to Noisy. Slashed foul. This was, at one point, a 9-3 Gateman lead. But two runs in the fifth, two runs in the sixth, and now one controversial run so far here in the seventh. And we've got ourselves a one-run game. O two 2 to Noisy, low and in, ball one. Justice on second. 
Noisy, the go-ahead run at the plate. The one-two from Zombro. Hit sharply down the third baseline. It's a fair ball. This will tie the game. Noisy rounding first on his way to second. It's a stand-up double for Sheldon Noisy. And Harwich has scored two in the seventh. Six runs since the fifth to tie this game at nine. Not a bad pitch either from Zombro. Looked like a slider low and in. All Noisy did was drop the bat head on the ball, and it just hugged that left field line all the way. The reflex and the initial movement of Caraviotis over at third was a bit delayed, but I don't think it would have matter mattered either, either way. Not really hugging the line. Cooper Ferris leaving the Gateman dugout near side. And now walking to the far side just perhaps as an excuse to bark some more at the first base umpire. Palmero will be intentionally walked, although the first pitch was closer to a strike. Ferris still outside the dugout, jawing. Again, if you missed what happened, this inning is still alive because Jay Jabs, the Gateman right fielder, dropped a foul ball or what we thought was a foul ball. It was called fair down the right field line. It went for a two base error, scoring a run. That was off the bat of Justice and Justice just coming in to score on an RBI double by Sheldon Noisy to tie up the game. So Noisy at second, Palmero who was intentionally walked at first, and now Johnny Adams at the plate. Adams one for four on the day, singled and scored in the fifth. Sharply up the middle, down for a hit. Warren has a good arm. He comes up throwing. It's offline to the cutoff. And the throw to third not in time. So the Mariners take the lead, 10-9 to nine here in the seventh. Really an eventful play all around. Johnny Adams hit that ball in the screws right up the middle. Warren came up firing, but... I think it was the right call from Zombro to cut that ball off. And then his throw to third base kind of sailed on him a bit. They may have had the runner over there in Palmero if the throw was a little thrown with a little bit more force, but he looked like kind of lollygagged it over there and Palmero safe on third, first and third situation. Now Kevin Biggio reached base three times in four plate appearances, an RBI double in the first, scoring two, a walk in the third. A walk in the fifth came around to score and then tapped out to first in the last inning. First pitch to Biggio, sharply to first. McKinnon gets it in the bread basket, tags first, and that'll do it. But three runs for the Mariners in controversial fashion. And at the end of six and a half, Harwich 10, Gateman 9. You're listening to the Cape Cod Baseball League Network on WCTV. Cooper Ferris barking at anyone who will listen. Three runs for the Mariners in the top of the seventh and they regain the lead 10 to nine. The three runs scoring at least in part because of a call by the first base umpire on a drop fly ball by the right fielder Jay Jabs. At this point though, everyone involved turn the page, move on. The Gatemen have shown good resiliency here in past games to respond whenever they're down on offense. The bats have certainly come around. They've been good here today, but now they'll be tasked with a one-run deficit one more time. And yes, it was unfortunate that that was potentially a blown call that could cost them this ball game. But you have to turn the page, flush the toilet, and now respond here. Gateman have the right guys up. It's 3-4-5 here in the bottom of the seventh. Darren Shepard takes high ball one. Shepard one for three. Excuse me, one for two on the day with a double in the second. Came around to score and a sacrifice his last time up in the fourth. He takes a strike. Siavarella still out there. He struck out the side in the sixth. In two innings now, he's yet to allow a run. Only one hit. He has faced the minimum. The 1-1. One, one. Hit foul and out of play. Mariners got the first three in the first inning. Gateman got the next nine, seven unearned runs 
in the second inning. One run in the third, one run in the fourth. Since then, though, it's been all Mariners. Two runs in the fifth, two runs in the sixth, and three runs in the seventh to take the lead again. One and two missing outside. It's now two and two. And the value of getting the leadoff runner on base, always important for the Gateman this season, extremely important. They've scored twice more tonight in three opportunities when the leadoff runner is reached. 2-2 two, two to Shepard, missing low. Count runs full with Logan Sowers on deck. Gateman looking for a base runner. Good things have happened to them with runners on base today. The 3-2 to Shepard. Fouled back to the screen. That two-run seventh, obviously sticking out. Excuse me, that seven-run second. Getting my numbers mixed up, but all seven runs unearned. Not to discredit the offensive output, though, for the Gateman. Four of those runs scoring on a two-out grand slam off the bat of Jay Jabs. The 3-2. Got him swinging. Fourth straight strikeout for Ciavarella, and Shepard is gone for out number one here in the seventh. It's so tough to muster up a pulse at the plate when you've had such a big lead like the Gateman did. A 9-3 ball game in the fourth inning. Their offense has kind of fallen asleep at the plate. Back-to-back 1-2-3 -back, innings notched by this Harwich pitching staff. And now they'll have to show some life once again and really get the bats rolling. Logan Sowers takes up and away ball one. Sowers responsible for the last run the Gateman scored. That was back in the fourth. He had an RBI double with two down. The 1-0 -oh to Sowers. Big swing and a foul tip. Count now one and one. That was a home run swing right there. Sowers getting a pitch middle in and low. Type of pitch he likes to golf out of there. The 1-1 one, one from Ciavarella to Sowers. 2-1. and one. The 2-1 two, missing in. Going to the backstop. It's 3-1. Second consecutive three ball count here for Ciavarella. Sowers looking to reach for Charlie Warren, waiting on deck. From the windup, the 3-1 to Sowers. On the inside corner. Sowers shaking his head. The count runs full. He was on his way to first. And power to him not pulling the trigger there on that 3-1 pitch. Obviously not something in the zone that he would want to pull the trigger on in a hitter's count. He obviously would have... Much preferred the walk, though, than to have to do things again with a 3-2 and two count. Full count to Sowers. The delivery got him swinging. Five straight strikeouts for Anthony Ciavarella. The two most recent here in the bottom of the seventh, and now there's two down for Charlie Warren. And so now there are two things wearing on the minds of the gate. And it's the Jay Jabs drop in right field that they presume was ruled against them and ultimately cost them those three runs in the seventh inning. And now the potential blown ball four call, obviously not as big of an issue and an impact on this ball game, but any time that a base runner is wiped off the board, not going to help a rally. And this is just human nature. Once you have an opinion of something, you tend to notice things that affirm your view. So if you think the umps are out to get you, as the Gateman might be thinking right now, any controversial strike or ball call could mount that argument. Count quickly 0-2 to Charlie Warren. Warren won for three on the day, singled, came around to score in the second. On the outside corner, strike three. For two consecutive innings, Anthony Ciavarella strikes out the side. We're through seven. It's 10-9, Harwich over Wareham on WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network.
Back at Spillane Field, Jay Jabs, you can see, still out in right field. He was the center of attention in the last inning. A dropped fly ball down the right field line was called fair and extended the Harwich rally. They ended up scoring three runs to take the lead. It's 10-9. First pitch to Matt Gonzalez as a swing and a miss. Tyler Zombro still out on the mound for the Gateman. Pitch chopped foul out of play. Good job by Zombro getting Matt Gonzalez in a quick 0-2 hole. It's been since the second inning, the last time the Gateman retired the leadoff hitter for Harwich. And it's Cost them dearly. A 9-3 ball game is now turned into a 10-9 ball game. 0-2 oh, misses low in the dirt. It's 1-2. and two. <laughs> Gonzalez, 1 for 4. Singled in the 5th. The 1-2. Strike 3 looking. It was a half swing. It didn't matter. It was a strike anyway. And Gonzalez is retired for out number one here in the top of the eighth. Zombro, a temp player for the Gateman, and he has a, an interesting case right now that he's making for himself. At least, at the very least, another glance. He feels as if he's, had, he's run into some poor luck. The jab's miscue should have been caught, should have been ruled the foul ball as well. This one hit well to left, but Sowers has it measured. He puts it away out number two. Yeah, all three runs surrendered in the seventh off of Zombro's arm. Unearned. One of them charged to the previous pitcher, Mike Adams, who had walked the leadoff hitter in the seventh. That run unearned as well. So lots of unearned runs this evening. Nine hitter Brock Dethridge, two for four on the day, two singles. He takes strike one. Also two stolen bases. He's stolen third twice. And both times been stranded on third after he's gotten there. Oh one. Sounded like a broken bat. Nice diving stop by Caraviotis. Up quickly to first in time for the out. Nice play by Caraviotis on a one, two, three top of the eighth. Gateman still trail though, 10-9. You're watching WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back at Spillane Field, Eric Reamer joined by Jake Garcia and Megan O'Brien. The Wareham Gateman once had a healthy 9-3 lead. But seven consecutive runs for the Harwich Mariners. The last couple, in very controversial fashion, have given them a 10-9 lead. It'll be 6-7-8 for the Gateman here in the bottom of the eighth. Two up to face Anthony Ciavarella, who struck out the last six batters he's faced and has faced the minimum through his three innings of work. Ball one outside. The perfect guy up at the plate to figure out Ciavarella. He hasn't been retired so far today. McKinnon, a three-for-three three hit night for him. Fouled back, strike one. Three for three, two RBIs, two runs scored, and his first home run of the year in the third inning. One of two home runs for the Gateman and three in the game. The 1-1. One, one. Hit into shallow left field. Center fielder, Deathridge has it. Not carrying as far as I anticipated it. Perhaps a bit off the end of the bat. And I think because it was an outside pitch and McKinnon pulled it, not going to go as far as we originally anticipated. If he would have laced that one into the right field gap, that probably would have been the more uh, suitable response from him dealing with that pitch. And pulling that ball, obviously going to result in an off-the-end-of-the-bat hit. But he made contact against Ciavarella, so that's a plus. Step in the right direction. Baby steps. Seven strikeouts through three and a third innings for Ciavarella. Preston Grand Prix swings at a 1-0, sends it foul. Grand Prix 0 for 2 in three plate appearances. Sacrifice fly that drove in a run in the second. Ground out to third and a strikeout swinging back in the fifth. 
The Gateman looking for something. A base runner. Anything. Count now two and one. And they're asking that from the part of their lineup tonight, which has provided them with the least production in Grand Prix and Rheinflesh on deck. Neither of them on base tonight, a combined 0 for 5. Grand Prix hits it well to left. Gonzalez, though, puts it away. Nice running catch in left center field. So two down. Although, like we said, baby steps for the Gateman. They're now putting the ball in play, at least, against Ciavarella. And that was a very good swing by Grand Prix. The pitch low and in. He dropped the bat head and squared it up pretty nicely. Gonzalez, though, showcased some good range and some good speed, ranging over to his left to snag that ball. Now the catcher, Jarrett Ryanflesh, 0 for 3 on the day. Last time up, he wrapped into an inning-ending 5-4-3 double play. In the on-deck circle is Sam Dexter, who, unbeknownst to us, was brought in the game to replace Caraviotis for the last half inning in the field. So it was Dexter who made the nice inning-ending diving stop. And he will bat if Reinflesh can reach. Looks like he might. The count quickly 3-0. And we've established that McKinnon, a very good eye behind home plate since he is a catcher and a former pitcher, so up at the dish, very unlike him for him to venture out of the strike zone. There's a strike on the outer half of the plate. The count now three and one. Ryan Flesh still in a hitter's count, probably looking for a fastball here. He gets it, he takes it, it's on the outside corner, Ryan Flesh didn't agree. He was on his way to first. Three two from Ciavarella to Ryan Flesh. Foul back to the screen. And you can tell Ryan Flesh has a quick memory there, or a short one, if you will. Those two pitches not in the locations that he wanted, and he thought both of them went for balls, and then he comes back quickly. Doesn't wear it on his shoulder, steps back into the batter's box, and takes a good cut that would have been strike three had he not pulled the trigger. Another 3-2 from Ciavarella to Ryan Flesh. Hit well to center. Deathridge back, ranging back to his left and puts it away for out number three. So three outfield flies. Years, and the Gatemen are retired 1-2-3 in the 8th. We'll head to the ninth with the Harwich Mariners leading 10-9. You're watching WCTV on the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Back at Spillane Field, Eric Bremer, Jake Garcia, Megan O'Brien, for a while, we thought we were going to bring you another handy Wareham Gateman victory. But the Harwich Mariners had other plans, seven runs in innings five through seven, and they have retaken a 10-9 lead. First pitch fouled off by Nick Walker, the leadoff hitter, making his sixth plate appearance. Zombro still out there. 0-1 misses inside. Again, the Gatemen at 3-1 looking to win their fourth straight game. A three-game win streak, already their longest since their championship season of 2012. They also had a four-game win streak and we believe a five-game win streak in that same season. To end the season, going into playoffs. So they ended on a strong note and then that carried over into some postseason success. 1-1 misses very inside. It's 2-1. It'll be 9-1-2, or at least those spots do up in the Gateman lineup in the bottom of the ninth. Hit well to left center field. That one's going to find the gap, and it's going to go all the way to the wall. Walker has a double. He has a, He's going to go for three, and he is in safely with a leadoff triple. First hit of the evening for Walker after he's been on base twice. And he gapped that one, and no hesitation for him as he rounded second base. He was going three all the way. Significant 90 feet, though. 
as now a runner on third base, no outs. All you need is a ball in play. And that'll bring the infield in for Wareham. Two-hitter Connor Justice at the plate. He was the one who hit that fly ball down the right field line. As Coach Lawler out to have a chat. And we will have a new Gateman pitcher. So Zombro's night is done. We will take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have more on the new Gateman pitcher. 10-9 Harwich over Wareham on WCTV and the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. It'll be Pete Grasso for the Gateman with a runner at third and nobody outs. Trying to make sure that when their offense comes to the plate in the bottom of the ninth, it's still a one-run deficit. I've seen Grasso once this season, the 10th against Falmouth. Threw an inning, hit a batter, and showcased a fastball. Upper 80s, 88 to 89. Can push 90 if he really rears back and throws. He's a middle infielder by trade, though, so making the transition to the mound here for the Gateman. Justice has scored two runs today. First pitch taken away, ball one. Just one for five. But as we mentioned before, reaching base on that error by the right fielder Jabs that led to three runs to take the lead in the seventh inning. Nice stop by Ryan Flesh behind the plate, 2-0. and For Grasso coming into this ball game with the runner on third, giving up this run doesn't hurt his personal line, but a big part of, of a reliever's job is to strand inherited runners. It's a difficult task, as there are no outs on a runner on third, but... It's one that he'll have to shoulder here, trying to keep the Gateman only down by one. Gets a strike, and it's two and one now. Infield playing in on the edge of the grass. They'll go home if they have a chance. The two one. Misses high, three and one. You might think about not throwing a strike here, but the three-hitter Sheldon Noisy on deck, he had an RBI double his last time up. Regardless of whether or not that's what he wanted to do, it's ball four, and Justice is aboard. Runners at the corners, nobody out for Sheldon Noisy. We'll see if the middle infield now decides to play back. Grand Prix and Kirk discussing and weighing their options right now. I think it will be the official decision coming from the dugout, and it looks like they'll stay in. So... Ignoring the possible double play up the middle. I'd guess, though, if a high chopper were hit towards the middle of the field and Grand Prix were still able to come away with it, he'd opt and elect to try for a double play. The speedy Walker at first, the speedy Justice, excuse me, Walker at third, Justice at first. Ball one missing high. This is a scenario when you'd want someone that you can trust late in the game, a shutdown guy. But it's so early in the season, and this staff, as the runner goes, the ball is a strike, no throw, down to second. So now two runners in scoring position, nobody outs. The count one and one. An eerily similar situation that we're now approaching. Compare it to the seventh inning when there were runners on base, and the pitcher was tasked to navigate the middle portion of this order. Deeper and deeper you get, the more success that this top of the lineup has had against the Wareham Gateman pitching staff tonight. And so even with an open base at first, you're going to want to attack the hitters. 1-1 one, one to Noisy. 2-1. and one. Just to complete my thought, it's something that will come with the Gateman and all these other teams as they figure out who they can go to late in the game. But that's part of this early season process, trying to figure out who that is. Ball hit in the air right field. Jabs has a great arm. Finding it, setting up for a tag. The throw home is up the line. It'll score a run. Grasso doing his job, backing up the throw. Both runners advance. One of them scores, and it's now 11-9. Looked like that ball kind of tailed a bit more than Jabs originally anticipated, and it brought him more towards the line, and he was unable to get his feet set, if anything, a few steps behind the ball so he could catch it and on the run, crow hop and throw in. Nevertheless, though, I think it was a point that's irrelevant because Walker has good speed 
Yes. And that ball was deep enough into the outfield that he was going to score anyway. Preston Palmero to the plate. His two-run home run in the sixth. Brought this game even closer at the time. Ball one is high. Palmero takes a ball low now, 2-0. and oh. Again, the Mariners scoring three runs in the first. The Gateman coming back with a seven spot in the second inning. All of those runs unearned, but a grand slam by Jay Jabs doing the most damage. 2-0, hit down the left field line, and it is going to be a foul ball. Out of our view, but I believe it was close. So the count, 2-1, and one, just a long strike. And Palmero was vying for his third hit here tonight. He's had some really good at-bats. He walked back in the seventh, and then, of course, two-run home run, and he added a single to that as well. So putting some good swings and making some good contact as well. To complete the ledger, one more run in the third for the Gateman, another one in the fourth. And then the Mariners coming back with two in the fifth, two in the sixth, and three in the seventh to take a 10-9 lead. They have one more here in the ninth. 2-1, fouled back. It's two and two. Leadoff triple by Walker came around to score on the sack fly by Noisy. A subsequent walk is now at third base after a stolen base in that same sacrifice. So it's Justice at third, Palmero at the plate. The count two and two. Cracked foul down the third base line out of play. Another loud strike off the bat of Palmero. He's seen the ball well right now. But if you're Grasso on the mound, all that is to you, two strikes that you have against him. Now's where you showcase your strikeout pitch. Another 2-2 two -two from Grasso to Palmero. Hit sharply left center field. Warren back on his horse, reaching up. He can't come up with it. The run will score. It's off the wall. Palmero into second easily with an RBI double. And the lead now, 12-9, Harwich over Wareham. What a day at the plate from Preston Palmero. Fourth RBI so far, third hit of this evening. He's swinging a powerful bat in the middle of a Harwich lineup right now, and they seem poised to have erased that 9-3 deficit now with a three-run lead. The inning not over as Johnny Adams steps to the plate. He has two hits. One run scored, one run driven in. Off-speed pitch finds the outside corner, strike one. You felt this Harwich offense was due. And sure enough, they were. Broken bat, back to the pitcher. On to first, easily two outs. The runner at second, Palmero not advancing. So much of that bat was sawed off, I thought that Johnny Adams released it entirely. Turns out the knob stays in his hand. A good pitch there from Grasso to locate the end of that bat and saw him off. And it looks like we're going to have another Gateman pitcher. We'll keep things here. We have plenty to talk about. Two runs so far in the ninth. This inning began with a leadoff triple to the left center field gap by Nick Walker. Connor Justice followed it up with a walk, stole second, runners at second and third, a sack fly to right field off the bat of Sheldon Noisy. That scored Walker, brought him home from third and advanced Justice to third himself. After that, an RBI double to left center by Preston Palmero. That was over the head of Charlie Warren. So it's a three-run lead for the Harwich Mariners. Last time the Mariners had a three-run lead, it was in the middle of the second inning after three first-inning runs. The Gateman countered with seven runs in the bottom of the second, all unearned. And the Gateman will hope for that result again in the bottom of the ninth. In that second inning, they got a big hit from Jay Jabs. That was a grand slam. Jabs will be due up third in the ninth inning. 
The new pitcher for the Gateman, Ben Parr. Parr coming from Georgia Tech, a sophomore. Another guy who will be making his first appearance here tonight for the Gateman. Left-handed pitcher. Back in school, split time between the rotation and the bullpen. Georgia Tech team missed out on the NCAA tournament by losing its last five games, which essentially allowed Parr to report to the Gateman a bit early. He, like I said, hasn't been used yet, so a fresh arm, and his use has been spare so far. Here, though, in tasked with protecting a or maintaining a three-run deficit. Pitcher number six for the Gateman. Williamson started this game. He went three and a third inning, giving up three runs, one of them earned. Kevin Biggio steps to the plate. He drove in two with an RBI double in the first. He's walked twice since and grounded out to first base twice. He takes a strike. Par lefty, that's always valuable to have. And although the Mariners have hit balls hard all over the place this evening, you feel like things could have been a bit more controlled for the Gateman had they just thrown strikes with that big lead. Hit weakly to first. McKinnon gets a bad hop. He tags first base himself, and that'll do it for the Mariners in the ninth. But they add two more. And we head to the bottom of the ninth with the Gateman needing three to extend this game. You're watching WCTV, the Cape Cod Baseball League Network. Chris Godfrey says it's not over. We'd like to believe him. The Gateman need three here in the bottom of the ninth. It's 12-9 Harwich. It'll be 9-1-2 and two for the Gateman. Sam Dexter, who would come in as a defensive replacement for Mark Caraviotis. Then the leadoff hitter, Tanner Kirk, and the two hitter, Jay Jabs. They'll need all those players and more to pitch in if they want to extend this game or end it with a Gateman victory. And they'll have to do that off the closer, I guess, at least the early season closer so far for Harwich and Luke Scherzer. A lot of guys on this Harwich team have relation to former major leaguers. No relation to Max, though, or none that we can find. One save so far in this season in his one inning of work. Notch two strikeouts as well in that outing. He hopes that one day he'll make the amount of money that his namesake does. Pretty talented right arm as he's ahead quickly 0-2 to Sam Dexter. Dexter in his first plate appearance of the evening. Receiving the 0-2 from Scherzer. Chopped to the right side. High hop, off the glove, and safe at first is Sam Dexter. It was a tough play by Palmero. He got it right in the stomach, bounced into foul territory, and then the throw, not in time. It'll be an error, a tough error for Palmero, and the Gateman have their leadoff hitter aboard. Well, that's always the recipe for success. You need one run. I, excuse me, three runs, not one run, and the best way to go about doing that is to get as many base runners on as possible, put the ball in play on the ground, and make the defense make plays. Sam Dexter, good hustle there out of the box. Now the Gatemen have the leadoff runner on. Fourth error of the game for the Mariners. The first three came in that disastrous seven-run second inning. The Gatemen just need three as strike one is delivered to Tanner Kirk, but they'll take four as well. And now they're getting into that portion of their lineup, which, granted, has struggled lately, but the most lethal portion of their lineup, the one that led that second inning charge. Kirk takes low ball one. The Gateman not sad to see Anthony Ciavarella go. In his four innings of work, he faced the minimum, allowing only one hit, striking out seven. The 1-1 one -one to Kirk. High fastball fouled back to the screen. The count one and two to Tanner Kirk, the runner, Sam Dexter at first. 
the delivery from Scherzer. Kirk lays off a breaking pitch, it's two and two. Scherzer from the set. With the 2-2 to Kirk, got him swinging. Breaking pitch in the dirt, it's out number one here in the ninth. And it was a good one there from Scherzer. Went low and went hard. A lot of movement on that breaking pitch. Looked like a slider from Scherzer. Kirk was doing all he could to protect. You saw him choking up on the bat. But even that couldn't solve the nastiness of that pitch from Scherzer. Now it's Jay Jabs who has a chance to redeem himself for the error he made in the field in the seventh inning. That led to three runs and eventually gave the Mariners a lead. First pitch inside, misses ball one. We can grouch about the first base umpire's decision all we want. If Jabs makes that catch, the inning's over, and the Gateman might still have the lead. As it is, the 1-0 misses low 2-0. Jabs' overall contribution to the game, though, has to be highlighted by his grand slam back in that seven-run second inning. He also was hit by a pitch and came around to score in the fourth. As he fouls this one back, it's 2-1. and one. And his overall contributions on the season have definitely been a net positive, showcasing all five tools that he has, and that fifth one shown today with that grand slam. He's been a dynamo at the top of this order for Wareham, and here when they need him in a big time situation, we'll see what he can do. First, Luke Scherzer steps off. No reason to hurry here. Coming in in a save situation, trying to shut down the Gateman and end their winning streak. The 2-1 to Jabs. Ooh, off the outside corner. Looked good from up here. I was about to call it a strike, but Home plate umpire did not agree. It's three and one with Darren Shepard on deck. The three one to Jabs. Hit in the air down the left field line, foul and out of play. The count runs full. I don't think you send Dexter here. His run doesn't matter. You don't want to run into any extra outs. I totally agree with that too. Base to base for the most part, no unnecessary risks worth taking. That is, of course, if the tying run were to get on base, then you do everything in your power to get him into scoring position. 3-2 to Jabs. Chop to the right side, it'll find grass. It gets the outfield. Dexter to second. So a single for Jabs, seeing eye, chopped through the right side. And now the tying run is at the plate and Darren Shepard. Looked like that hit was made possible by the fact that Biggio was shaded over towards the middle of the field. Not hit very hard by Jabs, but in the right place, and he'll certainly take that second hit here tonight. And now second runner this inning aboard. With Ryan Lidge going out to talk to Scherzer. Talk a little bit about Darren Shepard. His only hit of the game came in the second on the pitch after Jabs' home run, his grand slam. Shepard lined a double and came around to score later on an error by the third baseman, Johnny Adams. He's one for three on the day, two strikeouts swinging, and also a sacrifice bunt in the fourth. And now we're venturing into the portion of the lineup that can really hurt Scherzer on the mound. Sowers has been the one to showcase the power already. Shepard, he's hit some balls hard though, gap to gap power so far. But you better believe one swing of the bat and Shepard could tie this ball game up easily. Dexter at second, jabs at first, Shepard at the plate, swings at the first pitch and sends it back. Luke Scherzer, Luke Scherzer, excuse me, we must assume, is the closer for this Mariner team, coming in with a three-run lead in the ninth inning. Taking out, notably, Anthony Ciavarella, who had faced the minimum and struck out seven through four innings. The 0-1. Hit in the air to right field, it'll be down for a hit. Dexter rounding third, he'll come home. Jabs into third. An RBI single for Shepard and the tying run is aboard with one down here in the ninth. 
And little by little, this inning has suddenly made this game a whole lot more interesting. Two runs now separate the Gateman and a tie ball game. They now have Logan Sowers up at the dish. And we mentioned his light tower power that he has. And he'll be looking to uncork all of it right here. You didn't think this game was going to end quietly, did you? Not a chance. Not one bit of a chance. Both teams now in double digits for scoring. As a member of the Mariner coaching staff out to the mound. No indication has been made to the bullpen. No one warming that I can see down there. So it looks at least for the time being that this will be Scherzer's game to win or lose. The tying run at first in Darren Shepard. Jabs at third. And Logan Sowers at the plate representing the winning run. Sowers with an RBI double in the fourth and he reached twice in his first two at bats on errors. He struck out swinging his last time up. First pitch outside ball one, a close pitch. But now the Gateman perhaps getting the benefit of the close call. Sowers with a big swing and a miss, strike one. The one one from Scherzer to Sowers, back pick to first. He's back safely. The count, I believe, two and one. Yes, we did not get any indication that, that was a strike, so two and one. Ryan Lidge, a very talented defensive catcher, but if you ask me, that's taking a very unnecessary risk there. With the, a runner on third base, potentially making this game a one-run ball game, and the tying run on first. And now some confusion over the count. Home plate umpire saying that that was indeed a strike, even though we didn't see any indication. Evidently, the Gateman... Bench did not see any indication. Tensions mounting even further here in the ninth between the Gateman and the umpiring crew. So instead of two and one, the count now 0 and one and two to Logan Sowers. The pitch from Serger with the runner going. It's strike three, the throw down to second. The ball is dropped. It could have ended the game, but the slide by Shepard going into second lodges, dislodges the ball, and the game's still alive. I think that's a trade-off that the Gateman would absolutely take. Moving that runner over into scoring position, sacrificing an out to do so, potentially the swing on Sowers by, on that play, if anything, slowed Lidge down at least a tiny bit. So now Charlie Warren. Taking a first pitch for a ball. How about this situation? You come in from Rice, first game out, and now you're asked to potentially tie this game two outs in the ninth. Warren, one for four on the day. The 1-0 from Scherzer, low in the dirt. Nice stop by Lidge. You do not want to put the winning run on base, but if this gets to 3 0, we'll see how Scherzer creates Warren. With 2 0, Warren should get a pitch to hit here. The pitch from Scherzer just misses the outside corner and it's 3 0. It's worth mentioning, too, that David McKinnon's the guy on deck. A three hit performance for him. Been seeing the ball very well at the plate. And so a walk here to Warren would bring up a guy that Harwich probably doesn't want to face in this situation. The count, 3-0. There's a strike on the outside corner. Looked like it was further outside than the 2-0 pitch. But no one cares what I think. The count, 3-1. and one. Charlie Warren at the plate. Jabs on third. The tying run, Shepard, on second. The 3-1, right down the middle, strike two. The count full. And Warren probably taking all the way right there. You want to... Let Scherzer show, throw as many pitches as possible. And why not? You have a strike to work with if you're him. No problem hitting with two strikes. The 3-2 from Scherzer. Warren chops it in front of the plate. Scherzer has it. He bobbles it, and he eats it. 
Jab scores from third. Shepard on to third. Warren reaches. And we have ourselves a one-run ball game. Oh, my goodness. Charlie Warren it looked like he slipped a little bit out of the batter's box or took a little bit longer than you would normally anticipate from a left-handed hitter. But then after that, put on the PF Flyers and was down to first base in a very quick time. And it seemed as that play developed and developed that Scherzer on the mound got a little bit more nervous. Error on Scherzer allowing this game to continue. Excuse me, an infield base hit. So an RBI. And now David McKinnon, who has a three-hit game. One of those three hits, a solo home run into the football bleachers in left field. Gateman trailing by one with two down in the ninth. First pitch on the outside corner, strike one. McKinnon cocks his head in disapproval. The tying run at third in Shepard. The winning run at first in Warren. The 0-1 will have to wait. A fake to third, fake to first move. We've seen the Gateman a few times this season get runners on the move when they have a first and third situation. But here with your hottest hitter at the plate and the tying run on third, I'd be very surprised if these runners were off. 0-1 to McKinnon. Hit on the ground to third. Softly, Adams has it. Throws across, and that'll do it. The Harwich Mariners eke out a one-run victory by the score of 12-11 over the Wareham Gateman. It was close, but Luke Scherzer gets the save despite allowing two runs in the ninth inning. So the Gateman winning streak comes to a close after three games. They move to three and two on the year. Disappointing, of course, to score 11 runs and not win a ball game, but they'll be back at it tomorrow with a doubleheader against the Orleans Firebirds in Orleans. Going through the box score, the Harwich Mariners got off to an early start, scoring three runs in the first inning. Only one of those runs was earned. It was a one-out single by Connor Justice, stealing second, scoring on an error by the shortstop Preston Grand Prix off the bat of Sheldon Noisy. Preston Palmero singled. Then Kevin Biggio with a two RBI double. That extended their lead to three nothing in the first. In the bottom of the second, lots and lots of offense for the Wareham Gateman. Seven runs, none of them earned, thanks in large part to three errors by the Mariners. The inning started with an error by the third baseman, Johnny Adams. Charlie Warren singled. David McKinnon singled, drove in a run, advanced to second, and Warren advanced to third on an error by the left fielder, Matt Gonzalez, letting the single get past him. Preston Grand Prix drove in a run with a fly out to center. Then Caraviotis with a single. Tanner Kirk hit by a pitch. Then the big blast, Jay Jabs with his first home run of the year, a grand slam to right field. On the next pitch, Darren Shepard with a double. And then Logan Sowers in his second plate appearance of the inning reached for the second time on an error, this time by the shortstop Connor Justice. That brought Shepard around. So seven runs for the Gateman in the second. They had a 7-3 lead. In the third inning, they added another one on a solo shot by David McKinnon, his first of the year. In the fourth, they added another. A hit by pitch by Jay Jabs, advancing to second on a bunt by Darren Shepard, then scoring on an RBI double by Logan Sowers. Then the Mariners clawed their way back, scoring two runs in the fifth, leadoff single by Johnny Adams, a walk by Kevin Biggio, a single by Matt Gonzalez, an RBI single by Brock Dethridge, and an RBI fielder's choice by Nick Walker. That made the score nine to five. Two more runs in the sixth. The inning started with an error by the third baseman, Mark Caraviotis. Right after that, Preston Palmero made the Gateman pay with a two run home run. And that made the score nine to seven. In the seventh, things got controversial. Lead off walk, two outs quickly, and then with two down and a runner at second, Connor Justice lofted a fly ball down the right field line. Jay Jabs crossing the line had the ball hit off his glove in what we thought was foul territory. Instead, it was ruled a fair ball, and Lidge scored. Justice rolled into second with an E9. The inning extended 
The next batter, Sheldon Noisy with an RBI double. Preston Palmero intentionally walked. And then an RBI single by Johnny Adams, giving the Harwich Mariners a 10-9 lead. Then in the top of the ninth, the two runs that really ended up killing the Gateman. A leadoff triple by Nick Walker. A walk to Justice. A sacrifice fly scoring Walker off the bat of Sheldon Noisy. Then Preston Palmero with his second big hit of the game, an RBI double that would prove to be the eventual winning run. Down three, the Gateman mounted a rally in the bottom of the ninth. The first batter reached on an error by the first baseman, Preston Palmero. The, after a strikeout by Tanner Kirk, Jay Jabs reached on a single. Darren Shepard, an RBI single. And then, on what looked to be the last play of the game, a number right back to the mound, but Luke Scherzer couldn't handle it. He instead ate it. Another run scored on what was generously referred to as a single. But then David McKinnon with the tying run at third, the winning run at first, grounded out to third to end the game. We will briefly try and give you our totals, or at least as best I can add them up, before we have our post-game interviews. My color commentator, Jake Garcia, will have our player of the game. And Megan O'Brien will have Coop Scoop with manager Cooper Ferris. Cooper Ferris obviously upset over that call in the seventh inning. He was barking at whoever would listen to him. First the first base umpire, then everyone else pretty much. He was pretty steamed about it, and rightfully so, as those three runs probably wouldn't have scored had, well, one, had Jabs not made the error, and two, had that call been ruled a fair ball. From our perspective, behind home plate, it certainly looked to be a foul ball. And when we have our WCTV broadcast archived on YouTube, I'll take a look at it and we'll try and figure out once and for all if that was the correct call. As I put together our statistics, the Harwich Mariners victorious, scoring 12 runs on 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 10, 12, 14 hits. The Gateman gave them two errors, and they used them both well. Run scoring in all of those innings. Excuse me, three errors and run scoring on all three of them. On the other side, the Gateman scoring 11 runs in nine innings. They got 11 hits, just three in the ninth inning, and none in the sixth, seventh, or eighth after Anthony Ciavarella shut them down. The Mariners gave them four errors and even more misplays. The one number that sticks out is the left on base for the Gateman. They only left on three, excuse me, four in the game, and two of them in the ninth inning, one of them the tying run, the other the winning run. Again, we're going to have our post-game interviews with our player of the game and Coop Scoop with manager Cooper Ferris. We'd like to thank you for sticking with us. A tough loss for the Wareham Gateman, ending their three-game winning streak. They now move to 3-2 and two on the year. They were tied for first place in their division going into this game. And for a while, it certainly looked like they were going to extend that game, ex that winning streak, excuse me, to four games. They were up 9-3 to three for a good part of this game. But again, the Mariners scoring nine runs in the last five innings. The Gateman only mustering two in the ninth oh. inning. And the Mariners walking away with a 12 to 11 victory. We're gonna take a quick break because this is taking a bit longer than we expected. When we come back, we'll have post-game interviews. We're back at Spillane Field with, I'm Eric Bramer, joined by Jake Garcia and Megan O'Brien. And Megan O'Brien about to interview Manager Cooper Ferris with Coop Scoop. Megan? Thanks, Eric. I'm joined by Manager Cooper Ferris for Coop Scoop here on the Cape Cod Baseball Network. And Coop, obviously not the result you wanted in that game today, but in the seventh inning there was a call on the first baseline. I know you weren't happy with that call, but what was the conversation exchanged between you and the umpire? Well, the, the ball, the ball hit our guy's glove and then hit the fence, you know, and, and he was clearly, you know, three. I hope. I don't know what y'all saw up there, but hopefully, you know, it, it was what I thought it was. You know, the their first, well, I'm not going to say that, but I thought it was foul ball. 
And how did that call end up changing the mentality of this team moving forward? Well, I don't know that it changed the mentality, but, you know, the big thing is those guys can't figure in the course of a game. You know, they've got to do their job. And, they, you know, we had, I thought, three or four check calls that, that you know, should have been gone. And uh, guys got on base right after them, you know. But, it, you know, a lot of that's us, too. We didn't, we didn't play real good defense tonight. We should have caught that ball, first of all. We should have, you know, we should have made two or three more plays that we didn't make. We had five errors and walked six guys, and we had nine, three, two counts. It's really hard to play defense when you're, you know, always 3-2. You never know when a strike's coming, you know. You, you'll find your best defensive games are guys that are strike throwers that, you know, we can stay on our toes, toes and do what we need to do. But we didn't do a very good job of that tonight. Uh, defense was off, but offense was on. I know earlier today we spoke and you told me they were working on hitting the opposite yard during um, during early outs today, and you said it was, it was impressing you. What was your early opinions on the bat swinging today? Well, the biggest thing, if you stay inside the baseball, you know, you, you – you're going to hit, and and uh, you know you're not going to have any issues there. Uh, the easiest thing to do in the world is to throw the top of the bat at the ball and pull the ball. You know everybody can do that. My little three-year-old granddaughter can do that. You know, but the big thing is we got. You know, you can't go up there trying to do that because you'll you'll run out of bat. You know, you got to you got to make sure you're staying inside the baseball. And I thought you know we're getting better at it. We're still not where we need to be. There's still a few guys that are trying to get outside themselves and and uh, get past the hitting point, and uh, you know that. There's a lot of strikeouts occurring in those guys, so you'll see if you check it out, you'll see see what I'm talking about. But you know that's them learning and them. You know we've got a little thing in our locker room that's you know the two strike approach, and and hopefully they're checking it out. I know we've cut them down since the Brewster game, but you know we still got to do do a little better job of that. Now tomorrow doubleheader. What do you say to your guys bounce back from tonight's loss? Well, you know, the big thing, I just told them, they got to get in a routine. You know, this is professional baseball to them. You know, they've got to learn how to take care of themselves. There's no off days. There's no, you know, whatever. Uh, you've got to you've got to really uh, grind it out every day, and you've got to find your – I told them I talked to them about major league players. I asked them, you know, what the, what's one of the hardest things, and that's getting in a routine. And that's what we're trying to train them to do is play professional baseball. So hopefully we can, you know, add a little little insight to their – path along the way. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Back to you upstairs, Eric. We'll join us shortly with the Gateman Player of the Game. Cooper Ferris, always diplomatic, always positive. A tough loss for the Gateman, but the great thing about baseball is if you have a tough loss like this, you can get back at it tomorrow. And that holds even more true with the Gateman as they have a doubleheader against the Orleans Firebirds at 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock Eastern tomorrow. We'll be heading up there and Right now we're joined by Jake Garcia who has our player of the game. Thanks Eric, I'm now joined by our player of the game here tonight, David McKinnon, played first base for the Gateman tonight. Obviously not the result you guys wanted. Some umpiring calls didn't go your way either. What was the coaching staff's message to you guys tonight after a tough loss and as well having to rebound tomorrow with the doubleheader? I mean as a player you try not to focus too much on like the umping calls. Uh, They'll make good calls, they'll make bad calls, calls that go your way, calls that don't go your way. So pretty much they were telling us just to stay focused on the actual game. I mean, we can control how we hit the ball, how we pitch the ball, and um, just to come back tomorrow, bounce back, because we got two tomorrow and we can't drop any. Success of the team aside, you had a very productive day at the plate. Three-hit night for you, your third straight multi-hit game as well. What's been working for you? We all know the pitching of Cape Cod is extremely talented, but what have you been seeing at the plate? Um, well, I mean, we have... Here we uh, pretty much play baseball all day. Like we get down here at one, we take early work, we do uh, BP. So I think just taking extra swings throughout the day really helps. It's a lot different than college ball. Like you're only focused on baseball right now, and that's really helped me to just uh, focus on my balance, staying back on the ball. And uh, it took a couple of days to adjust to the speed of the pitching up here, but I think uh, right now I'm seeing the ball well. So hopefully we can see that tomorrow. Now, David, a two-sport athlete back at Hartford, plays soccer as well. You're a goalie for your team and a very successful one at that. You're a first baseman who profiles more as a speedster than your normal first baseman. How does the speed aspect of soccer really add that extra dimension in your running game in baseball? I mean, with soccer, we're constantly doing running. Uh, to warn, like, I don't get to take a break. I have to do all the running our team has to do. So that helps. And then we have a goalie coach that comes in. He makes us do all this agility stuff. So that really gets, uh, I think it really translates into the corner positions, either uh, first base, third base, or uh, outfield, really. So no matter what, just uh, the agility really, uh, I think, improves because of soccer. So despite the loss for the Gateman, David McKinnon, a three-hit night, hit a home run as well. Eric, back to you.
Thank you, Jake. And with that, we will sign off. We've been on the air from Spillane Field for about, well, three and a half hours. It's been a tough loss, a tough night for the Gatemen as they see their three-game winning streak come to a close, a tough 12-11 to defeat at the hands of the Harwich Mariners. But as I mentioned, we're back at it again tomorrow, 4-7, and seven, a doubleheader. It'll be tentatively, at least, Anthony Kay and Zach Plezak in the two games. Plezak in game one, Kay in game two for the Gatemen. I'm Eric Bramer for our broadcast coordinator, Warren Randolph, my color commentator, Jake Garcia, and our sideline reporter, Megan O'Brien, all the folks at WCTV. Thank you for watching, and see you tomorrow.